Well, Adam, way to go. I, I scared everybody away, didn't I? No, it's it's my own stupid fault. I I synced everything to the warning ah! on Dropbox. All right, here we go. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you for joining us here on the program. This is another installment of Path to Libertarianism. Uh, our first conversation with Miranda, where she came on and asked some basic questions that she was wondering about libertarianism, went so well that uh, Adam decided he'd send in some questions, and so he's here with Reinhold and myself, and we're going to talk uh, talk a little bit about... Um, what, 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 he's got all kinds of good questions. A lot about charity and how an ANCAP society would work, so... Uh, Stay tuned. We're going to answer his questions and hopefully yours right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. Again, my name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It is great to have you here. If you're new to the podcast, uh, we really like to break down the news and try to explain current events and help you understand what is going on. So when you're talking to your friends, you don't feel dumb. There's a lot of stuff going. You're busy. We're busy. That's why I have like 10 co-hosts because I can't keep track of the news all the time. And so uh, we've collected a smart group of people. Um, me- meanwhile, Ho- somebody ping Hody. I forgot Hody was supposed to be on this. Reinhold, ping Hody. Uh, tell him that he's on like Pacific Mountain Time or something. And Either that or he's rolling around in all that Mormon cash that we just found out about. Uh, so that's what this program is about. We are here to help you understand the, the news. And we do it from a libertarian perspective, which is not conservative. It is not liberal. Sometimes if you're a liberal, you'll go, these guys are on planet X. And then other times you'll go, wow, they're really right on. And if you're a conservative, you'll go, they make so much sense. And then other times you're like, but I want to bomb them. So there's something for everybody. Stay tuned. We have several different series. One is The Swamp Explained, where I talk to my friend Rob Cortell, who is a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C., and he helps us understand how Washington, D.C. works. We have just a regular show, which I guess I'm going to start calling the explainer episodes, which is almost every Tuesday night um, where we talk about the news and break down the current events. That is what we've done since 2012. And then we have the path to libertarianism, where I either talk to a prominent libertarian about their transition to libertarianism from something else or you know, their obscurity to celebritarianism. And or we bring on somebody like Adam, who has a bunch of questions, who's fairly new to the philosophy and just kind of goes, you know, I just have a couple sticking points. I mean, for me, early on, it was foreign policy. And then Ron Paul in 2008 debates helped me go, wow, I I guess I I get what he's talking about. That makes sense. I think I am a libertarian now. So um, let me first introduce our cast of characters. Let's start with Harry Price. Harry, it's so good to have you back after your bout of coronavirus. <laughs> First off, uh, what I had was awful, and I do not wish it on anyone. Uh, it was terrible. I uh, couldn't keep anything down um, except uh, broth, which uh, Gunther stole all the time oh. from me. Yeah, Gun- Gunther, the young price. Yeah, who Love I'm very, broth. which I'm still very proud of her today. Found out I found out from um, um, today on. Uh, at preschool she refused to say the pledge she she does it nice at preschool that's at no pre- coaching there just does it her own she's not saying the pledge yes yes yeah they try to get them at preschool level now wait a minute what like on philosophical grounds or just because she didn't want to stand up uh yeah apparently she didn't want to stand up she didn't want to put her hand over her heart and she didn't want to say the magic words oh uh, i'm pr- i'm very proud of her tell her <laughs> that that's worth at least a month in your contract in 2021 so when they 
Yeah, they told me that. I was like, oh. I was like, we're going to go get some ice cream. <laughs> what did, they, did they have like a problem with it? Or, yeah, like w- w- what was their reaction to it? They were, uh, they they were just kind of complaining. Like she just does what she wants. They gave me a look when I said, "Let's go get some ice cream." He's like, "Bitch, it's a Kapistan up in here, motherfucker." <laughs> yeah, they were like, "What do you mean ice cream? Huh, we're gonna get ice cream and celebrate." <laughs> So I love that you. you're teaching her to be disobedient to her public school teachers and rewarding her with ice cream when she doesn't say the pledge. It <laughs> warms, warms my heart. This is private school. I pay money for this preschool. Good. Good. Yeah. You should. Uh, also, here's Reinhold. Reinhold, how are you? I'm doing well. All right. Thank you for talking into the right end of the mic. <laughs> we're, we're learning every week is a learning process in this, mm-hmm. in this business, right? So, now, so, Harry, so brand uh, new. Harry, how long have I been in radio? You know, a couple of months. Uh, no, uh, almost 10 years now. No, 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 2005. Oof. Yeah. Oh, 15 plus years. Oof. Yeah. How long have we done this podcast? I've been a podcaster, I'll tell you the answer, since 2007. Okay, I'm going right. to go for 12 years. Reinhold, this mm-hmm. is the first time I ever felt like Joshua Smith or, or Michael Heiss in this program where I was annoyed with Reinhold because... I'm like, dude, you're talking to the back of the mic. No, 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 no. Reinhold, no, it's, Reinhold it said, I, I believe there's a public apology owed to the listeners. There was on the mic, it said back right there. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And that's the back, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I do owe a public apology, and there was a public apology for not listening. To who suggested that? To who? To dear leader. Thank you. Okay. That's the first public apology in many, many episodes by anyone, but the first one from Reinhold. Yes. <laughs> the first of it's many. First one, it's probably the first apology in years for, for me. And the man who is getting a donation card from this program is Hody Johns. Hody, yeah. as I go to introduce Hody, he immediately left. I said, I'm going to send a donation card, and I swear he dropped. Oh, okay, you're just off the screen. Okay. Oh. Hody, uh, I just got done listening to the journal podcast and reading the article in the in the Wall Street Journal about the Mormon Church of which you are a faithful member and your fund. And can I borrow twenty five dollars? Well, we got a hundred billion in the bank, and uh, I tell you what, a little bit of ad space goes a long way. It really so, does. So uh, I'm saying, I'm yeah. I'm about to get myself some magical underpants. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, my uh, renters uh, in my house, they are LDS and the church go- went ahead and covered their rent uh, for a month while the guy, you know, uh, poor guy was looking for work for a month. They heard and- the landlord was a podcaster and they said, we've got to. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad for the church. And now with that, we got a hundred billion in the bank. We don't know what to do with it. I'm kind of not feeling as bad anymore for taking it. So yeah. <laughs> now I want to, I want to clear up some conspiracy theories of which there were many. Hody and I did not have a fight. As far as I know, you were not mad at me and I was certainly not mad at you. Mm-hmm. The Daily came to an end. We closed out at 100 episodes of The Daily. We just felt that, you know, it was getting harder and harder to do. And you had some technical issues. Mm, yep. haven't, you haven't been around for a while. For what reason? Uh, my computer pretty much just couldn't run Zoom and couldn't couldn't stream it had a it it had a tough time doing all those things together and uh it was a it was a beast of a computer but it had given me five long years which is harry and niece and all those guys will tell you five years is about all you can expect in a computer these days so it's mac pro this mac pro is running strong harry 2013 this bad boy's been running fire up paladins then and see how it goes (laughs) <laughs> uh, why would I ever play Paladins? Well, Atricia Stewart was in a similar situation, and she just uh, I, I recommended a computer to her, so she'll be back doing podcasts regularly and gingerarchy. Uh, and here, and uh, Hody, what what sort of things do you have kind of on your docket? I don't even think I've asked you privately, but I know you're formulating some ideas for shows. What are you thinking about? Yeah, so uh, I'm excited. I'm so excited to have all of this back. I have been part of the Wall Reader. Uh, it's wallreader.com. If you guys haven't checked it out, you can get it off of Amazon as well if you want the printed paper color copy. Ryan Lindsay does that. He does an excellent job organizing the articles. So I've been writing while I haven't been speaking. Uh, I'm a far better writer than a speaker. The um, Man, the articles have gone far and wide, and it's just a really good thing for We're Libertarians. Great for the brand. We are pro- providing a ton of different perspectives. Each issue 
comes with something you will love and something you will hate. And that's something that I love. I just, I, I love being challenged. I love reading stuff that I disagree with um, and stuff that I agree with, of course. And it's just- Ryan, been- is, a, Ryan is a young Reinhold. He enjoys yeah. provocation and I really like that about him. Yeah, uh, I mean- he, he, provo- he, and he likes provoking thought. He's not a shit poster. He likes provoking thought, which I like. Me too. He's he's a good, uh, I I think this whole group has kind of rounded me out a little bit. I was certainly probably more right libertarian. Um, I am probably dead center libertarian now. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Dennis and Ryan for sure. Oh, see the, the, that Joshua Smith was right. The libs are taking over. The lib socks are taking over any moment. Now, Hody's going to be waving a red flag. I almost said something else and (laughs) waving a flag. Uh, (laughs) No, uh, yeah, so you can get the wall reader, walreader.com, or you can go to Amazon. You can get a print edition of the first two still, I believe, but you can get a Kindle reader, a Kindle version of all three, and uh, hopefully he has a print version coming out of the third. Has he, has he mentioned that or not? Yeah, no, he has. It's coming. Uh, it is for sure coming. And uh, yeah, that'll be great. I'm, uh, I'm going to get the debates fired up again. I'm going to move to the Oxford-style debates. Uh, I think thanks to this podcast, I don't know anybody... Uh, My first debate was going to be whether Trump should have been impeached or not. I got a ton for the should have been impeached and uh, a whole bunch of crickets chirping when I asked uh, if somebody wanted to take the shouldn't have been impeached side. So apparently people didn't want to debate that in a long format. I can argue that. I just don't believe it. Yeah. So it wouldn't be genuine, but I could do it. (laughs) Well, before we jump in to uh, introduce our guest, Adam, uh, I want to take a a chance to thank all of our patrons before we get on with the show here. Uh, I want to thank our $100 a month patrons, Ed Brehob, Matthew Durbin, Jeff Bennett, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, and Craig DaCosta. You guys are awesome. And the patrons keep all of this going. We're we're paying for the Zoom that we're on right now. We pay a lot for hosting. Um, we're working on a new logo design, which we're going to rebrand all of the different podcasts. You know, Brian Nichols, The Wall Reader, The Libertarian Aurora email newsletter. Go to libertarianaurora.com and you can get that morning newsletter every morning in your email box. If you listen to the end of last week's show, you understand why that's such a special time in the morning. Uh, but you should get the Libertarian Aurora email newsletter. And so we've got a lot of different brands now and we've got a lot of different logos. And so we're having... Uh, our good friend Brennan Goodcuff redesigned the logo. We're working on that now. If you want to contribute to it, hit me up, or you could just go to paypal.com slash we are libertarians. I'm excuse me, paypal dot uh, paypal dot me slash we are libertarians, and you can make a contribution towards that if you want to just help pitch in some dollars. If you if you uh, give a hundred dollars or more, I'm going to send you a free T-shirt with the new logo. Be one of the first people to see that logo once we've kind of finally get it done. Uh, and that's part of the first step in 2020 of moving things forward. And we're going to do the, the logo redesign, the brand redesign, get everything looking very clean. We've already updated the website. And then we're going to start uh, looking at uh, bringing back merch and maybe selling some ads, which is why it'll be important to be a patron. So you won't be annoyed with ads. Because if you're paying attention to podcasting, people are starting to notice how effective this is. And... Uh, so we're, we're just trying to bring in some revenue so we can help grow this and fund more creators and fund more libertarian voices out there. And that is what your Patreon money goes towards. And we thank everybody who is a patron. But I want to thank Andrew Bowman and uh, his wife, Megan, the long-suffering Bowman, I call her. Uh, he is a patron. He was actually a lapsed patron. And he just upped it. So if you're a patron and you're like, hey, you know, I'm in charge, log into the Patreon and uh, just double check that. And so he wrote us a great note. And if you're a patron or if you're just a listener, if you are out there and you're like, man, I really love this show. I want other listeners who may have be on their first episode. The reason I want to start reading letters like this at the beginning of of every episode is because there's a ton of people listening for the first time. And so those of you who have listened for a long time, tell the newbies why this podcast has impacted you over a long time. So send us an email at editor at weirdlibertarians.com. And Andrew writes... Chris, I know I've expressed this to you over the last year through our conversations, but I wanted to share a note with you for the listeners. I discovered Wall leading up to the 2016 campaign. My wife, Megan, and I moved back to my hometown to take on a new career adventure after living in Indy for about three years. We worked opposite hours and realized that there was more to life than money and a fancy career title. 
Once we settled into our new home and began our new careers, we found ourselves lost politically. We knew that our views and life experiences did not really match up with the two parties we always hear about. Megan was the one who introduced me to Gary Johnson. After a few searches, I found the wall feed. It took a few episodes, but I was hooked, and I have been ever since. One moment that really stands out to me is when you so openly discussed going to therapy to work some things out. As a man, we never hear other men so openly talk about mental health. I remember exactly what I was doing when I heard you talk about your own personal struggles so openly and with confidence. This hit me so hard because I also had some struggles personally that I worked through with a therapist. Hearing you tell your story gave me a sense of healing that I was not broken or any less of a person. Since that episode, I have been all in on wall. The friendships and the community that you have built are lasting and are things I value so much. Each contributor and co-host brings value in a great discussion. The way you've taught me to listen and learn from those with different views has been so valuable to me as I mature in business and a leader. As the dynamic of the show changes, I look forward to continued growth and the success of the wall network. I look forward to, uh, to the focus on how we can impact our community and those closest to us and what role we have in society. Keep up the great work, Andrew Bowman. A lovely letter, and I thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate Andrew's friendship and, by extension, his wife's friendship, and uh, we really appreciate them. They're, they're part of the wall coal mine where I force all the contributors into a, into a chat to be my friend or else I won't have any. So thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you to Andrew for, uh, for being a part of, of the team, just like everybody else. Thank you to Sam Schultz for putting, helping organize the notes together. Harry, Reinhold, Hody, Trisha, Sarah, Brady Wagner, Christy, uh, Paul Copeland. I'm going to leave so many people off. Uh, first and definitely last, Dale Melchin. I'm just kidding, Dale. Uh, so, <laughs> and all our friends at the Boss Hog of Liberty, the Brian Nichols Show, Ginger Arky. So we, we have such a great network, and I really appreciate everybody's friendship. And we invite you to be part of the community, too. Go to our, our website, wearelibertarians.com, hit the Discord. Harry's in there all the time. Reinhold's in there all the time. Hit the Facebook group. Hody and I are in there all the time. And uh, you, can, you can just be part of the group. Be a part of the team. Get to know some other libertarians that are like-minded, that are cool, that are not uh, uptight, and we're not going to yell at you because you might have a different opinion than we do. We're not, we're not, we try not to be jerks. I, I'm a jerk. Like, Hody's a really nice person. Mm -hmm. Reinhold, Reinhold's a really nice person. Harry, mm. a bit of a C word. But, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Harry's actually a great friend and a great person. But uh, I know I can call him the C word without it hurting his feelings. I'm just saying, like, uh, Reinhold just, you know, like, you just, you know, when you're in, Reinhold is just going to message you back. If you put pose a question and you really expect Reinhold not to respond to you in, in Discord, well, you are mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, are ready yeah. for an answer. Yeah. Just be ready. If you, you just if you want a book written to you, mm -hmm. you get ready for it. Yeah. Oh, it's not that he punches at you. It's just more of a, if you come with all ready with a full cup of water, he will overflow you and you won't accept any of it. <laughs> but if you come to Reinhold with an empty cup, he will make sure you are full. Well, so I want to thank everybody who funds this community and funds this podcast and all of those who are a patron. You're really making a big, big difference. And we invite you to come join us on the Patreon. And uh, I actually have a meeting with Patreon tomorrow to find out how I can better improve the services there and be a better, uh, better uh, father to our patrons. I don't know what, you, what you're called when you're head of a Patreon, but uh, I like to call myself a father to our patrons. Um, now... Let's jump in and let's talk to Adam because Adam uh, is one of the people out there who is newer to libertarianism and decided to write us an email and ask some basic questions and probably did not expect that we'd have him on Zoom, on video, talking to us on the air, uh, but he figured out Zoom. And uh, so, Adam, we thank you. I, I don't know if you want to say your last name. You're more than welcome to say your last name, but uh, I don't want to put that out there if you don't want that out there. Um, yeah, I'd rather not. That's cool. See, Hody, he's already doesn't want to associate with this. I, I didn't do it. <laughs> I, did, did we not mention those Mormon bucks? For yeah. Right. I, I, you, I you understand the check coming your way. You only have to go to like Saudi Arabia for two years and ride a bicycle. But um, so, Adam, how did you find the podcast? Um, it was in the run up to 2016. And I, I don't remember if I started listening in 16 or maybe it was 15. I started listening. 
Um, but yeah, in that run up to that election, and I was like, there's got to be something better out there than that. Well, we I'm hope we sure. haven't let you down. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine, you know, there has to be something better out there and people tune into this podcast and they go, finally. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> there oh, isn't. Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> finally, we I are, found the bottom. <laughs> we are fucked. <laughs> That's the scariest part of being an adult is you, when you're younger, think, oh, there's adults who will be in charge. These, my high school friends can't be the ones who are in charge. And then you get older and you go, oh, no. Uh, the idiot's the successful one. Uh, so Adam, so you found it, did you find it on like what, Google or iTunes or what? Uh, I think I was searching iTunes for stuff, yeah. Okay. It, it seems to be the, the main way that people find us. And so do you remember kind of what we were talking about? When, what, what made you keep listening to the show is what I want to ask. Uh, you know, the first couple episodes I listened to, I seem to remember you had a bunch of people co-hosting with you at the time like, like you were maybe having three or four people you know m more than just harry it was you know with a bunch of people all at once and it, your conversations would range all over the just place so confusing was... nobody was introducing yeah <laughs> <laughs> but get podcasting i'm sure <laughs> but i mean there was some really interesting stuff in there and stuff and there was definitely a lot of perspectives that i hadn't seen before and mm -hmm. i really appreciated that that's what kept me coming back. Cool. So what are some things that have kind of stood out, not just from the podcast, but like as you've kind of – like when did you – are you a libertarian? Have you made the decision? Have you, uh, have you – are you going to libertarian heaven? Have you converted yet? <laughs> I, I would say yes. At this point, I am a liberta libertarian. Uh, honestly, I, I still struggle to see how we would make the transition from where we're at now – to where we would like to be, you know, and of course, obviously there's quite a few differences on what is considered the ideal libertarian uh, position, but you know, there's such a wide range just within libertarianism itself. But yes, I, do, I would consider myself a libertarian and just learning the basics of the non-aggression principle. I mean, that, that's really a, been a big seller for me. Yeah, that can, that can really um, – do you want to take a chance on explaining the non-aggression principle? Like, do you want to, do you want to give it a shot? Well, I, I think it was put one way. It was like everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Tell people the truth. Don't hit them and don't take their stuff. Yep, I that's the great Ken Basan quote, former uh, board member of the Advocates for Self-Government, which, full disclosure, once employed me. Cody, what is the non-aggression principle? Don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. Thank you, Matt Kibbe. <laughs> right. <laughs> but let's, let's dive on it, in on it a little bit deeper. It, it is essentially government is force. Government is different than a private transaction. So we basically said to Adam, hey, we'd love you to come on the podcast. And he evaluated his choices and he made the choice to come on. That is different. That is a private transaction. That is different than us being the government and we work for the IRS and we say you are due to appear here and if you don't we're going to penalize you financially until we put you in jail or we're just going to put you in jail and so with every action by the government it is an act of force and so libertarians believe in not uh, achieving social or political goals through the initiation of force which means not using the government to force other people to live the way that we think they ought to live, but governing ourselves. It's a form of self-government. And so that is the non-aggression principle in a nutshell. It's, it's much more verbose than the perfect way that Adam put it or Hody put it, but it's a little bit more uh, fleshy, let's say. Um, so where, where, Adam, where did you come from? Were you, were you non-political, liberal, Republican? What were you? Uh, well, I, I grew up a very conservative Christian family, very, you know, very involved in church and very conservative, uh, religiously. And so my family and everybody I knew were re Republicans. Right. And that was it. So that was, that was the world I knew. Okay. The Mormons relate to you. Yes, uh, I, I've got the Constitution on my right here in the video, which you can watch on YouTube. Um, so 
let's talk, let's talk about some of the things that you're struggling with and some of your questions that you wrote in, you know, what, what is your first question? What is the thing that you're like, all right, I, I just don't, I, I'm having trouble getting through this concept. Uh, you know, the first question that I had thought of when you had put that feeler out there for folks to follow up on Miranda's episode, first question I thought of was, how do you respond to people? Uh, and I see this a lot on like social media, Facebook and stuff where they criticize libertarians by saying, you don't care. It's uncaring about other people. It's every, just every man for himself and, and they don't care about poor people, don't care about the environment, all this. How do you respond to that in, in you know, in a water cooler discussion, what's the rebuttal to that? All right. Let's, uh, who wants to take a first? Uh, I can start. So the concept that you're right, talking Hody, about is... Hody, let me identify Hody. Identify, <laughs> identify yourselves when you start talking. Just, we don't have that, that problem where everybody's confused who's talking. Oh, but I thought Adam fell in love with us during the confusion days. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, this is Hody. Uh, so what you're talking about is oftentimes called brutalism within the, uh, within the libertarian community. It is absolutely a concept, and there are some people who actually preach on libertarian brutalism. So it can be, it's not incorrect for people to perceive it that way because we have some fantastic authors. Hans Hermann Hoppe is probably the most famous, I wanna say, but Reinhold might disagree, but uh, who actually espouse brutalism. Let's say it is survival of the fittest, so let's embrace this survival of the fittest. Let's say whoever you know is the best at living gets to live on top and whoever doesn't kind of gets cast to the side and gets the crumbs of whatever is cast off. So you're not wrong to identify that and other people aren't wrong to see it because they're self-professed libertarians that this is kind of their goal. Now, major thankfully the majority of libertarians disagree on that point. So it is not, that's not inherent to libertarianism. While we preach individualism, one of the things that I want to stress with this question before I turn it over to somebody else is what it means to be an individual. If we focus on individualism, individ individualism means you can't be divided. I cannot split this from myself. That includes your life, your liberty. Most libertarians will throw, throw in pursuit of happiness and property as well. So if any of that is taken from you, this is not a libertarian society because they've been divided from you. If somebody takes your freedom, takes your life, takes your livelihood, takes your property, takes your pursuit of happiness, these are transgress against, transgressions against individualism. And so... One of the things that I would stress with this is community is not a bad thing. Collectivism we have a problem with. Community is the solution. That we form voluntary communities and we say, hey, look, I, I get that I'm all alone out here. This is something that the anarchists struggled with um, during at the collapse of feudal times was all the pirates banded together really well. And here we are living in our huts and we don't want to get along with our neighbors and band against them. So what we say is, hey, we want to encourage community communities without encouraging uh, some type of involuntary collective. And I think that that is kind of how we get away from the survival of the fittest and say, this is kind of a survival with the fittest, you know, as like a group. And I'll turn that over to somebody else. Yeah. And Adam, I mean, if, you have, if you have questions or if you want clarifications, feel free to jump in at any point, feel free to argue back or, or ask questions. Harry, were you going to go next? Uh, yeah, Harry here. Uh, wow, Hody's, wow, that's a great definition because, uh, or great uh, explanation. I feel like he was like reading my mind on half of that because the, that is the best response. It's, it's the idea that, yes, there are people that talk like that, but you don't have to, a lot of that whole survival of the fittest brutalism, that is, uh, uh, is an anthem of the human experience. The main reason why socialism and, and other, other systems fail sometimes is because they go against how humans are. We want to be social and help each other out. You know, so it's libertarian isn't it about that. You can voluntarily help everyone out. You can voluntarily start schools. It's this idea that a survival of the fittest, that's, it's, they are people out there that, that do think that, but that's not what libertarian is all about. Yeah, we had somebody, we had a comedian on, uh, man, I, I always forget this comedian's name, but it was such a good episode. I'll put it in the show notes of people. It was somewhere in the 100s. Uh, and, and he was talking about how he was, he, he's like, you know, if you saw a car wreck, 
mm-hmm. and a car went over a cliff and a group of you pulled your car over to the side of the road and you all started running. Would anybody start going, wait a minute, do you think that this person's Jewish? Do you think that that person might be a man? Do you think that that person might be a Catholic? Like, no, you see another human being in a terrible situation and so you act. Mm -hmm. And that is human nature. Human nature is seeing people in trouble and helping. Mm -hmm. And so what libertarianism enables us to do is to quickly react and quickly uh, respond to the needs of human beings because we are force-fed the idea that government is the most compassionate tool to solve the misery of others. But in reality, because of the nature of bureaucracy, it often becomes a harm. Because if, if you look at, at a company, for instance, they can grow profits, they can, they can scale quickly, they can make changes. They, yes, they can sometimes be bureaucratic if you're IBM or you're very big, but often a company is fairly agile in responding to needs. Same with a nonprofit. Nonprofits can move money quickly in, into other areas or do different things and, and respond to needs quickly. But if you've ever interacted with a government agency like CPS or um, Medicare office or another agency charged with helping, you often find that they are completely, what, what you often find with bureau- bureaucratic institutions like CPS, firefighters, uh, and they're, actually they're pretty quick to respond, uh, or a police unit or family social services, you get a lot of, man, I wish I could help you. We just don't have the resources or the rules don't allow me to do that. Or I'm sorry, that's terrible that's happening to you, but I just can't, I can't do anything for you because their budgets are set and their budgets are usually controlled by political considerations. And so they're the, the priorities are usually not the right priorities and there's no way to have any kind of recourse in that. And so what it is supposed to be a compassionate tool in government institutions becomes a tool of harm because it, it, it's diminishing services. Um, there's a, a, an episode, episode 91, where we, in our series called The Cost, just go through our RSS feed and search the word cost. And we've done a series of interviews with people who were harmed by government policies, by government bureaucracy. And you hear the ways that those government agencies tried to help, but unintentionally harmed. And people didn't help because they had, uh, they had a perverse set of incentives. And so, and, and even then, I, I think that libertarians often demonize government employees too much. I think that people, somebody that goes to work for, CPS deeply wants to help children and cares about children. And I think they're the first ones to tell you that this is not the, an appropriate way to help children. You talk to teachers, they want to teach, but the bureaucracy doesn't allow them to teach or do the jobs that they think they ought to do. You talk to police and they go, I, I want to do things this way, but the nature of the city council or the state legislature, it, it, it forces me into these positions. Soldiers, it's the same thing. It's the same story over and over and over. And what you see in the private sector is when people have that frustration, they start their own thing and build something new, something that actually helps. And so what what the left specifically will do is try to demonize libertarians and capitalists as an evil concoction of profit-driven monsters. But in reality, what you get with capitalism, what you get with libertarianism, are people who see needs, who see problems that need to be solved, and they're trying to find innovative, creative ways to solve those problems for people. Mm. Empathy and compassion are at the very heart of libertarianism, not personal greed. Yes, there are bad actors like a Bernie Madoff, but often those people get destroyed in their own pride, their own ego, their own greed, their own bad behavior is their downfall. And the people who are compassionate, the people who are driven to make a positive difference end up thriving. And that's part of why a free society works and a closed bureaucratically run system like the Soviet Union or North Korea fails because the incentives in a closed society or in a bureaucratic system or an administrative state as we're heading towards, the incentives are to just 
clock in, clock out, and not really make waves so you don't get fired. That's not empathetic. That's not compassionate in any way, shape, or form. So we've thrown a lot at you, and I'm sure Reinhold wants to jump in here too. So let's pause. Like, what, what are you hearing, Adam, and, and how are you processing it? Uh, I mean, I think that does make some sense to me. And uh, I think, like you said, a lot of people have that passion to help the people that are around them. Um, but you're right. There's, there's so much restrictions on the options that people have. You know, you're limited in the choices that you can make in how you interact with the people around you. What are the things that you can do? What are the avenues? And then obviously when your resources are being controlled so much by government, it limits your options. Yeah, you look at how politicians fight and then they go to the legislature and they fight over the, the funding decisions. And so the bureaucracies, the people who actually are on the ground, the people who work in those bureaucracies, they're going help. We need more funding. And then they can't get it. And so people don't get helped. It just perpetuates jobs for civil servants instead of actually serving the people that it's meant to. Are there people helped by government programs? Absolutely. Any libertarian that denies that people aren't helped by government programs is just a dishonest or an ill-informed person but the vast majority of people are not helped and help or help puts them on a path that creates dependence and, and it perpetuates a cycle that keeps them dependent on the state, which is really what the state wants oftentimes. Reinhold, I'm sure you want to jump in here on this topic too. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the way I usually look at this or answer this question is that, in order for, let's say, a welfare system to get voted into office, to get put in place, the majority of people have to agree that that's what we want to do. We want to pool our resources and help people. If they would just pool their resources and help those people, those people would get helped. Their thinking is, is that we want to make sure everybody covers, you know, we're going to use the force of government to make sure that even the people who don't want to help are forced to help, Right. So that's the difference between a voluntary helping and government helping. So the problem there is, is that even the government forcing that to happen, you still have those people who don't want to help are going to find a way to avoid it. They're going to not pay their taxes. They're going to work under the table. They're going to work on cash basis, that sort of thing. So they're going to try to find a way to vote. You don't like a Bernie Madoff exists. We have, all of these rules, all these laws, everything in this government trying to control, making sure that 10% of the people who aren't concerned about helping other people are forced to, and they fail. It fails miserably. And the only people that it ends up hurting are the people who are giving the money freely or who, who want to give the money freely. So we got, a, we got a situation. Let's say you got a uh, a woman who's got four kids. She's uh, her husband has left her. She's you know she's divorced now. She's trying to make ends meet. She's working. She's paying a babysitter. She's taking care of her kids, and she's just getting by, right? And then we decide we want to help some other people, so we put a tax on some things, on her income, and now she's not making as much. She can't do that, so she's just she's just barely cut, you know, barely putting her head above surface. Uh, and then she has something happened, her car breaks down, or she has uh, some, some sickness that her kid now is, is being, she's got to go take care of that and pay for that. Now she needs help. We have just created a person who needs assistance from other people because we were forcibly taking money. She couldn't, if we weren't forcibly taking that money from her, she could say, okay, this month, because I have this carb deal, I'm not going to give the money to the group that we all agreed to to get myself back into a good situation. And while I'm there, I'll give back to that. Or she could go to one of those organizations and ask for help, explain her situation, get a temporary loan. There's all these different ways this could be handled for all the different unique situations that everybody has. But because we want to use it as a political tool, a political hammer on our opponents is why this is being done through politics. We put those rules in place that prevent helping the people the way they need it the most um, and, and the, the way to do it efficiently. And, and it ends up just being, 
you know, a political, we, we end up putting politics and helping each other out. We shouldn't have politics in our healthcare. We shouldn't have politics uh, in our um, charities because that should be stuff that we just do with each other all the time. That's right. Because the problem is the problem is that when you're taking money out of my paycheck and redistributing it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't make me feel charitable, but if you donate to a charity, if you donate to a private organization, you're invested in their work, which we'll talk about more later, but I want to mention the bad actor, the Bernie Madoff scenario. When you have government force, when you have that presence of force, you have a gun at the, at the head of the rational good actors, so to speak, okay? Not necessarily a physical gun to everyone's head, but politicians without police officers are just people with bad opinions that nobody wants to talk to. Because they have police officers, and this is why there's so much tension with citizens and police officers, police are being asked to do way more than they've ever been asked to do because we're criminalizing way more than ever before because we're forcing other people to live in ways and it's it's a perpetuating cycle it grows bigger and bigger a bad actor like bernie madoff has no problem buying off politicians and crafting legislation for their benefit good actors like the people on this podcast wouldn't necessarily consider doing that or think that that's ethical because we act rationally and so a bad actor who cheats in a private society goes bankrupt a bad actor who buys off politicians in a public society gets richer because the state funds are then directed to their coffers in the form of monopolies. So monopolies are often brought up in, in smearing libertarians, but the reality is that a monopoly needs government force to exist. A government has to force all the other competition out of the, out of the uh, realm of possibility for it to exist. And so monopolies are, are, are a product of the state. Let me provide a very specific example for that. Very specific. Because we dealt really great with the philosophy here, Adam, but I want to give you, you know, when you're talking with people, you said you want a good explanation. And the philosophy sometimes makes sense, but people don't like it. To what Chris just said, here's a drug, Firdaps, F-I-R-D-A-P-S-E. Uh, there were two companies that were allowed to make it. Um, it dealt with uh, muscular dystrophy diseases. Uh, up to they started in the 90s and up till a year ago two companies were allowed to make it the the ingredients are so cheap both companies gave them away for free you might say well why would any company give away a medicine for free well not only was it cheap to make but they actually made more money just by giving away for free instead of selling it and having their advertising on the outside of the bottle right uh last year uh, uh one of them I believe it was Jacobs Industries, but they bought out uh, exclusive rights. They created a monopoly. The drug went to $375,000 a pop. That kills people, right? And, that, and that's a very real example. And so what, but what Chris is saying is when it had even a limited competition, there was one other competitor allowed. They said, well, we can't, we can't compete. You know what I mean? We ha it's free because this drug actually costs nothing. So we talk about the survival of the fittest society. Who is more unfit than somebody with muscular dystrophy? right? Somebody with ALS, M MS, somebody who's dying, you know, these people, we can see them getting taken care of under this. Now, what happens when the drug is $375,000? Well, we say, well, everybody has to pay for that. Otherwise I die. Okay, well, let's force other people to pay for your drug. So you see here the fake compassion from one side that says, we're going to force everybody else to pay for your stuff, like schooling or this drug. But this is the real compassion to say that, well, that drug is actually kind of free. You know, epinephrine, another example, if it's not regulated, it's like the price of a stick of deodorant. When it is regulated, it's like $200 for a needle to make sure you don't die of anaphylactic shock, right? I mean, this is, this is a very, these are very specific examples. And so they're not just hypotheticals. You can see actively the government making sure that people don't get education unless they pay for it so that other people can pay for it instead of the good actors that Chris is talking about trying to make it free. So I know I double dipped on this question, but you guys reminded me of a lot. All right, Adam. Well, it, so have, have we talked way over your head or have we answered your question? No, no, that's great stuff. And uh, as you had hit on like how bad actors profit off of the public system, you know, I don't think I'd ever quite heard it put that way, but it, it makes a lot of sense how they need that government regulation 
to maintain their monopoly and, and maintain their position of power. Right. And, and I, I just want to jump in real quick. There is a book that was written uh, a little over 100 years ago by, by a guy named Sumner, who uh, it was titled uh, The Forgotten Man. Uh, that phrase was then borrowed by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and turned up 100 degrees, 180 degrees on its ear. Uh, but it is a great book on exactly this um, situation. It's, it's not really a book. It's more of a, a long essay. Uh, but he, he actually has a calculation for A, B, and C uh, and who the forgotten man is, is C. So it's, um, it's something I'd recommend. I don't go into it too deep here because we've got other questions to go to, but just wanted to bring that up. You did a daily on that, right, Reinhold? Yeah, I did. I did Got do it. a daily on that. Forgotten what was Man. the title? It's one of our best. The Forgotten Man. Okay. Uh, go back in the feed and you can find that. Uh, all right. Let's go to the second question. What is your second question, Adam? Um, you know, I think to kind of follow up on what we talked about there, there another question I had was uh, dealing with talking about people who maybe are starting out from a disadvantaged position um kind of like when you're dealing with like systemic racism or um people who like just kids that grow up in a poor situation due to the choices that their parents made do first of all do we have an obligation for the towards those people yes or no and how would libertarian policy help those people overcome their maybe disadvantaged starting point. Would anyone like to go first? I, yeah, I could go on this one real quick. Um, f as far as us having a responsibility, I think we all have responsibility on helping everybody achieve their full potential as best we can. Uh, mentorship is a, is a big thing of mine. Um, I really think that a lot of times when we try to help people through a welfare system, everybody goes, okay, they're taking money out of my check. Uh, so I've taken, I've, I've done my part and I don't have to get involved. But the real thing that needs to be understood is that a lot of those people, that paycheck just helps them get by to the next paycheck, to the next paycheck. You know, we're not teaching them anything new. Mentorship should be what we do. And I think if everybody who was mildly successful just mentored one other person, I think we would see a, a big elimination of, of poor people. And there's a, a great example of this is a, specific, a person we know, uh, Rupert. Uh, and Chris can talk a little bit more about this, but he has a program that he's been helping kids in troubled situations and getting them uh, the mentorship they need. They become great members of society and it's all just done through voluntary work is none of that stuff is government related in any way. Yeah. So I have a, a radio show here in Indianapolis called now hear this. And I interview nonprofits operating in the Indiana, Indianapolis area. And uh, I've interviewed two subjects, uh, on this and really the whole show is kind of covering the topics that you're you're asking about um you know why do people why are people motivated to start charities i interviewed uh, a couple today shane and tia who are starting hope house in marion indiana they're former addicts and they want to start a recovery house uh, for people struggling with addictions to help them get clean because they themselves were in similar situations tia's life was saved by a recovery house and so because her life was so greatly impacted, she wants to give back and start that for someone else. Rupert, you talked about Rupert, um, you know, and, and his program. He was the first uh, person that I interviewed. I interviewed a, a nonprofit called the 24 Foundation. Um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the Starfish Initiative. The 24 Foundation helps raise, raise money to fight cancer, um, where hundreds of people across Indianapolis raise money to fight cancer. Uh, but the starfish initiative is based on the old tale, the starfish, you know, the two men are walking along the beach. They see a starfish. One man throws a starfish back in the ocean and the other man goes, there's hundreds of starfish on the beach. You can't save them all. And he goes, but I could save that one. And the starfish initiative is taking people who are in networks of power of which I would say everybody on this podcast is in a network of power. We are, we are middle class. We are uh, in upwardly mobile jobs. I don't know about your situation, Adam, but I know about the other, uh, about the four of us who are on the show here. We are, we are, you know, I have the ability to pick up the phone and get within one or two phone calls of people who have power that can help me solve a problem. 
I'm in a network of power, and that is because I was raised in a middle-class home, wealthy. I had a good school, a good education. I've worked hard. I met the right people, and that helped me get ahead. And there are people who are not, who do not have the same access to networks of power. And so what this charity does is they pair someone like me with someone who is uh, clearly a bright student who is not excelling well at school and they pair them with cross-cultural people. So as a white male, I'd probably be paired with a young black female or a young black male in the inner city. If I were a black male like Harry, I'd probably be paired with a poor white person or a, a Burmese or Vietnamese person on the South side they, because they want the experience of both of you to have access to a different culture that you don't understand. My entire, my entire reason for doing the Pat Down podcast with Ms. Pat and Dion Curry is to have conversations in a very fun and entertaining way about race and to show that somebody who is as white bread from Plainfield who grew up in a very advantaged situation like I did can be just can be close comfortable friends with somebody like Miss Pat who now lives in the town that I grew up in but grew up in a very disadvantaged situation and lives in a culture that I don't understand and don't always get and vice versa you know and so the whole thing is how do we converse with each other and so as a person who has several has a media job who has certain talents with broadcasting I've made it I've made it part of my mission to talk to people about these things like uh, do do I think that because white privilege exists it should be a penalty for white people no but do I think that as a person who has access to power who has different advantages do I have a responsibility to try and help people and bring diversity about absolutely and I don't do that because someone's forcing me to do that. I do that because that's just the right thing to do because there's no reason that people should grow up in situations uh, in poverty stricken situations when I'm able to help. And again, it goes back to empathy and compassion and alerting people to the ability to join something like the starfish initiative, go and be a mentor, help someone who is an eighth grade, who is bright, but has no one in their family that has ever gone to college. So no one knows how to fill out a college application. No one has the skill set to understand what the ropes may be to getting to college. Go mentor someone in that situation that can have a bright future uh, and get themselves to a position where they may be able to, to, to rise above their station and, and get access to those networks of power. Uh, I think first we have to admit that imbalances exist in society. And I think for people, uh, especially on the right, people who are white because we are, are, we're still a majority, but because there is a greater share of voice in society being given to people of minority status with the exception of Harry Price on this podcast, uh, it, it makes white people feel uncomfortable. What, what, what I always try to say is that you can be a Republican, a Christian, a conservative, or a libertarian. You can be someone of our ilk and understand that a black female who has interests that you don't deserves to see her interests represented in Super Bowl commercials, and that isn't a threat to you, your identity, or your position. It just means that we are to live in a more equitable society. We are live, to live in a society where I should be able to get in the car, Harry should be able to get in another car, and we should have the same percentage of a chance of not being killed by the police. That's a perfectly reasonable outcome. And so... Um, do we have a responsibility? I think anytime you're in a position of any type of power, you have a responsibility to use that power to benefit other people who don't have power because as all boats, as the tide goes up, rises. Um, you know, do, I think, is segregation inherently a bad thing? Segregation exists. And, and so we self-segregate, we're self-discerning, we're always going to sort ourselves into sort of similar groups. If you look at the numbers of the people that listen to this podcast, surprise, surprise, it's white male, Christian, conservative-leaning, libertarian men who live in the Midwest. Hello, 
you know? And so they're attracted because I think a certain way, I attract people who sort of think the same way. Okay. That's part of the reason that I bring on people like Reinhold and Ryan Lindsay and Harry and, and Gina Martinez, who was very liberal, but, and was constantly challenging my thinking or Lynn Swayze, who or Joe Ruiz. I, I'm constantly trying to bring people on who think maybe more from the left than I do, or, you know, who have different life perspectives because Harry, mm -hmm. my black co-host, you have taught me so much about an experience in this nation that I didn't understand coming from a 98% white community. And so I think you and I had to choose like, Hey, we don't want to self segregate. We want to break through that and we want to have conversations. I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair to say. Um, the, it's, you do, it's the idea of having the social obligation, but it's a voluntary social obligation as a human being. It's voluntary. If you wish not or want, do not want to participate, well, that's voluntary, but it says some, it just more says something about your character or what, or what you just have time to, if you don't have to, if you don't have time for something like that, but it's voluntary. You get to make those choices, just like every other choice in life. You can make this choice and choices all, all in all have consequences. Right. Yeah. The, yeah, and I would say that when the government tries to end segregation and force identity groups together mm -hmm. before they've made the choice to be together, it usually leads to escalation of violence, violations of the non-aggression principle, property damage. It usually leads to clashes between those two sides when the government tries to socially engineer an outcome. And, and it doesn't work as well as something like a podcast that is comedy based mm -hmm. where we all kind of go, Hey, I have this, I have this question. Why is your hair different than mine? Yeah. And it's a safe place to ask those questions versus F you, why are you stealing my opportunity? Which our, is usually what forced segregation comes about when the government tries to do it. Our hair is different because we're meant to exist beyond the stars. Uh, white people are meant to stay here on earth. So black people can leave them here. Um, but no, <laughs> The yeah the forced segregation thing is always done haphazardly, and we usually get ridiculous laws in the books that we still have today that we cannot get rid of. Uh, one of them being unemployment. The other one is uh, these ridiculous laws like it got to have a license to cut hair. You got to have so many hours of schooling to cut hair, which was you know it it, it was a tax against like minority people to get rid of uh, basically those. Um, ugly minority barber shops and to get them to stop braiding their hair. You know, this way we can control all that. It's th these ridiculous laws that get put on the books that are just still there today, just like stupid alcohol laws. Yeah. And even, you know, something like Chris Rock's movie, good hair mm -hmm. and, and trying to break down, Hey, don't straighten your hair, let your hair grow as is. That is beautiful. You don't need to adjust beauty mm -hmm. standards. I think a lot of that stuff is good. It doesn't threaten me. I'm okay with it. Like, the fact that Harry is a different skin color and has different interests. Harry is way into video games. I don't care about video games at all, but Harry's a good man and we have a lot of common interests and we bond over those things. We don't have to, we don't, I think it's a control thing. Um, so we've talked a lot, Harry and I have kind of talked a lot about the more the segregation, the racial aspect of it, which is really the foundational principle between these economic disparities. But your, your specific question is about primary education. How do we fix that? Uh, you see things like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation doing a lot of work with that. But I, I want to turn it over to Hody or Reinhold to kind of tackle that. Like, how do we fix? Well, let me stop. Let me ask you, Adam. Was there anything in there that you found concerning or that you have more questions about before we go into the education piece of your question? Uh, no, I don't think... I have any follow-up questions on, on what people were saying there. Um, I do think, yeah, yeah the forced, the, the forced diversity attempts also often just backfire or have so many unintended consequences. I'd listened to a really interesting episode of a um, podcast um, called Hidden Brain. It's an NPR show. And they had done a, an episode where they talked about how um, students who had a teacher who was the same race as them, um, especially for uh, minorities, they tended to be more successful in, in, in class and they were more likely to go to college. And it was just a very uh, eye-opening thing that 
you know, maybe trying to force diversity into these situations isn't necessarily the best thing for those people and those kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me turn it over to Hody or Reinhold. Go ahead, Hody. Uh, yeah, Hody speaking. Uh, a history of being enslaved is not something that we can get over and just let it organically go away. This might sound like I'm crying for government, but it's not. It's just something that we have to work on. The Jews, when they left Egypt, had to spend a long time in the desert before they were able to actually be a society because they were so used to being slaves right? This is slave mentality. They say, well, I, you know, I, I'd rather just do the hard work and have everybody else do everything for me. You're, you're used to becoming property. There's an entire area of psychology where you study what makes a human being different than an animal, right? Because we're aware we're different. There's things like culture and, and uh, co complex language, uh, higher thought processes, um, you know, uh, create creativity, um, entertainment, these types of things that, that we don't see animals engage in as often that makes humans different. And almost all of those things were systematically eliminated for black people upon becoming here. You become property. Let's go ahead and delete your culture. Let's go ahead and delete your language. Let's delete your religions. Let's delete your heritage. These are things that make us humans and we made them animals, right? And so when we say, well, let's just let's take off the leash and now we're ready for the feral dog to just become a human being. That's not the way it works, right? And before I, you know, I know people are hearing me call black people feral dogs. It's not at all what I'm talking about, but we did that to them. We treated them that way. So this is how they respond when they say, okay, now here's, here's something I do want to bring up. The closest we ever had to fixing the disparity between the black family and the white family was right before the war on poverty. Okay, and this is something that said, as soon as we said your father figure, they never caught up, but as soon as we said your father is replaceable with a paycheck, you're just, you're just money is all you are. And we'll provide that money. Well, what's the dad say? Well, I don't need to be here anymore. I'm replaceable by a paycheck. I'm just stuff. I'm just property. I'm just a cog in this machine. And now you've given my family an ability to replace me as a cog in that machine, right? Now the war on drugs also set them back further. But, th but that was really the beginning point. I actually had to look it up. I was listening to another podcast that talked about how the war on poverty did this to the black family. I didn't know. But we actually lost more fathers as head of their, black fathers, the head of their household during that time than we even did during the war on drugs, which also set them back, right? So how do we fix these things? Well, it's not a matter of saying, here's more money. We talk about reparations. We've been paying reparations forever. We pay, we pay money. We pay money. We, we, we're constantly willing to say like, hey, here, we'll help you catch up. We'll, we'll do some affirmative action. We'll, we'll force colleges to, to integrate you and all these things. Why doesn't it work? Because that says we have to have you here, but we don't want you here. Okay. Like, you're replaceable by a check. You can kind of take it or leave it. You know what I mean? We really don't need you. Now you look at successful companies. You look at those board of CEOs. How many of them are all white men? Man, that used to be true about 20 years ago. It's not anymore. Let me give you a real life example of how that impacted my father in a certain way. Now my dad, I wouldn't, he, he's apolitical. He doesn't care. But his big thing was he said, he used to not see the value in diversity. He was very upset one day, he, he works for Lockheed Martin, right? And he had a, a, they gave him a stack of 20 applications from women, thousand applications from men and said, you have to hire 10 from each pile. And he resented it because he said, that's not fair. I'm taking half the women. I'm giving just a fractions of a percent of the men. And a lot of these women aren't as qualified as these men. Now, one time uh, he had to hire a, a person who was of the uh, Muslim faith. And so, well, I don't think that's fair. He doesn't belong here. But told me one day when he got home, he was like, man, his diversity of experience has changed. The He's not as qualified as some of our guys. And that's true. But he made us think about solid rocket motors differently because the way he was brought up, he was brought up to think about what if we did them on the outside instead of on the inside. And sure enough, on one of their, late, their later versions of this rocket that he was designing, they put them on the outside because it just balanced better. So diversity has an inherent, there's an incentive for it. It's an inherent good whether we know it or not. You can look at things like the Austria-Hungarian Empire where they, they merged like 30 different cultures. Now, each of the cultures wanted to stay in its own zone, right? They liked getting together, but they realized just functionally their whole society was stronger and they, were more, uh, they had access to more luxuries 
than any other country in the entire world. They actually had the highest standard of living, including America, in the entire world because of their diversity. Diversity is an inherent good. You can ignore it at your own risk. Would I say segregation is bad? I think we've tiptoed around the issue. Allow me to be the first one that says, yes, it is bad. It is not as good as desegregation. When you have that diversity, you learn more. Are you going to learn more from a diverse range of people? You could just say, I'm going to learn from the smartest person ever. Smartest person ever was a Shinto female. We all just be Shintoists, right? But that's not the way really even knowledge works. And so it, it involves this diversity. And so there is a natural incentive if you let if you make the government step aside and say, stop treating people like property, stop treating us like cogs in this machine and let us do our thing. And then we say, you know what? We need a diverse range of maybe not races, but because we've chosen to divide around, around racial lines, we need diverse experiences, diverse origins. And so we're going to say, you know what? Our CEO board is going to be comprised of a lot of people of a lot of different experiences. And that means they tend to be different races, different religions, because that gives us the broadest scope that helps us see see more, do more. There's a market incentive for it. Yeah. And that's one thing that I've always tried to do with wall. And I think our Facebook group has one of the most respectful dialogues towards women out of any libertarian group in the movement. And that's something I'm proud of and I will fight to maintain. And we've always had a lot of female co-hosts. We've tried to, I've tried to recruit female co-hosts that are willing to spend two hours a week talking to a bunch of dudes about libertarianism and uh, are willing to put in that effort and uh, just, you know, the, the cross section of um, female libertarians, it, it, A, that's a, that's a small population. And then it's hard to find enough people to be committed to doing what Reinhold and Harry and Hody and, and everybody else does. And, uh, but one, one thing I've learned in broadcasting is that I need to have female voices, specifically young female voices who are slanted towards more the left side of our society because that is sort of the demo that's the demographic right and so if i want to have uh somebody listen if i if we have women out there listening i want them to hear someone that thinks that the way that they do working this stuff out too you know what i mean like i want i don't want just a bunch of people to look like me think like me and talk like me I want, if you're listening to this show, to hear yourself represented. Um, and I just think that's, it's really important. With the Pat Down Facebook group, I was really nervous about that. It's the Bob and Tom fans, which are usually white, rural, think Duck Dynasty or Trump voters, mixed with the Breakfast Club audience, which is urban and black, mixed with the Joe Rogan black t-shirt audience, mixed with the We Are Libertarians audience of libertarians. Like, I was sure that that Facebook group was just going to go to hell in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. honestly, it has been amazing because all these different streams of people have started to learn and joke with each other. And, and, and it's been, you know, uniting around the things that we agree on has kind of been the healing thing. And I know that we have not talked about education, Adam, and I apologize for that. But I think the, the reality is the root of your question is the inequality and why that exists and how do we fix that. And the reason that there are segregated schools is that there are some, historically, some groups of people use their power and their advantage to maintain that power and advantage. And other groups have a very hard time breaking into those networks of power. And what I love about society in 2020 is the willingness across so many segments of our society, led by the millennial generation, to say, enough, just because you were a poor black kid at 34th and Keystone or a poor white kid in Shelbyville, you should have the same educational opportunity as a kid in Plainfield or Carmel. And how do we make that happen? How do we make sure that things are more fair, more equitable? And, and what can I do in what I do on my daily basis, on my daily life to make that, that inequality? And I think that that just is a part of so many different aspects of society it, it is the choice that we each have to make. Mm -hmm. And I think it starts with just like, what are you fighting about on Facebook? I think for me, you know, I think after 2016 and through 2016, I, I think I was very much, uh, I haven't gotten more liberal, certainly not, uh, not in my politics in any way, shape or form. 
but I think I have, I have uh, tried to take off the protective armor and listen a little bit more. And that's just what I would encourage people to do. You know, check out the Pat Down. Check out the Now Hear This podcast. Check these things out. They're not, they're not preachy. We're not trying to preach to you. Not like, you know, I'm, I'm being more preachy here than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. But the reality, I, and Harry, I hear you kind of, mm-hmm. But like, I, I mean, you've been around for nearly five years. I mean, mm-hmm. I personally, I don't know if you've seen the difference, but I have tried to be, there's a lot of money in trying to cater to the white male identity on the right. There's a lot more money than trying to be decent. <laughs> There sure is, right? <laughs> yes. There oh, sure is, man. right, buddy? Oh yeah. There, <laughs> there sure are is. there are people out there just doing that, are they? I mean, that yes. would be so cynical. Yeah. I just don't feel well represented. <laughs> There's so much more money. <laughs> it, uh, right. Only, only e girls can make more than the Jordan Peterson. I mean, I'm not saying Jordan Peterson does that, but like the people who are like, I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan, and that's their flag that they're waving to try to recruit people. You know, right. and we, we saw it long ago with Chris Cantwell, and then look who he turned into. Look at Stefan Molyneux. Like, you know, Cantwell and Molyneux are two guys that I never promoted on for years on the, we are, uh, on the We Are Libertarians website or the Advocates for Self-Government website or the LibertarianPodcast.com website that I run to mm-hmm. promote other libertarian shows. I've never put Cantwell or Molyneux on there because you always knew who they were. You just could tell. They just didn't say it out loud. And now I'm not surprised to see them go that direction and try and recruit people who, you know, there's, there's good money in that, but it just doesn't, it's not good for the soul. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, right. more, it's more fun well, to be friends with black people. It's more <laughs> fun to more eat spice. Mexican food. It's more fun than trying to be pissed off all the time because of the myth that you're being robbed of your, of your advantages. Your life will be enriched if you just stop being so angry all the time. But the good thing is, is that the, the society taking care of that sort of thing seems to be working as well, too, because, you know, we complain about the platforming on YouTube and stuff like that. But for people who make that a toxic environment, those companies are saying, no, we don't want you on here. And now people like uh, Ma and you are saying, I can't make I can't go work a regular job because of what everything I've said. So they're pushing me out of this. So I, I think that's kind of how a libertarian society would actually function is we would start saying, you, you know, we don't like that extreme view that you have. We're going to kind of disassociate and make it harder for you to continue to do that. We're not going to force you to. You can still say and do whatever you want to, but we're not going to feed into it anymore. We're not going to make it a right that you have uh, to have access to all of this. Yeah, and I don't even necessarily agree with that. I I don't. I mean, I listen to Gavin McInnes, and I don't agree with. I listen to Rush Limbaugh. I listen to Ben Shapiro. I don't agree with these people on a lot. I listen to. uh, But there's there's a difference. I I I listen to Vox. You think there's a difference, but I listen to these people, and their their views, like those people, I think are a lot different than Molyneux. All right, so right. let me draw the line. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I know people will put McInnes in there, but I think he's tried to clean up his act and tried to, to be a little different, I think. But what I've seen in him is that censorship pushes him further into that identity. And same with Molyneux, same with all these guys. And when, when we try to push people out and you try to censor ideas, you push them further into the identities that you're trying to break them out of, right? You know, Gavin McInnes, Ben Shapiro... Rush Limbaugh, though they may be parasites to the people that write for the New York Times, represent a large view of the majority, really, of the people of this country. And, they, and when you try and censor those types of people, now Molyneux, and just blatantly racist things like that. I, I mean, I just totally, I get when private companies go, I don't want to have you on our platform. You're bad for business. Go start your own, figure it out, which a lot of these people have done, um, you know, but it, it's, it, I, I don't know. So, um, Adam, I feel like we, we wandered way off the reservation. I hope that we even came close <laughs> to answering your question, pal. No, that was good do we stuff. Ever, I appreciate do we ever talk about education? 
I don't think we got to it. <laughs> we come close, e- buddy? Easy answer. The government answer is there's 20 seats in a classroom. That classroom's the best in the nation. Costs one million dollars to get in there, and we're going to force that classroom to put three minorities in there. So it's still going to be majority dominated, and you're going to have a few token minorities in there. All right. <laughs> what is the first wh- colleges? Yeah, the first colleges in the United States were privately funded. They were uh, charity done, you know, same with the, ho- the, the hospitals. They were charity based. Southern, Southern Methodist University. Yeah. And as soon as you start getting government involved, then you start introducing politics into how we're teaching these kids and what we're teaching them. And instead mm-hmm. of teaching them how to think, now we're just teaching them how to pass tests because that's the measure we want to have. And it's, it's like you have no choice no more, right? So if I had kids and I wanted them to go to a good school and I'm only locked into this one school and that school is terrible. Yep. Mm-hmm. You, where's the choice? You know, the, it's kind of put me in a bad situation. You see Harry, the limit um, on opportunity. Well, let me go to Harry. Hey, go hey, ahead, Harry. Hey, white man, shut up. Harry, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, and a lot of things they do is let it uh, shut the community out of um, dictating what's going on in the schools. You'll notice that with uh, certain oh, yeah. school districts will use the unions to uh, you know, bully down the teachers so you can't get rid of bad teachers. They say right. you have to bring your kids, if they live in these lines, have to go to our school, regardless of how bad we are. You, it doesn't matter. You have to go through here. And, and those same systems also try to block people when they try to break down those barriers. We saw that happen here in Indiana when people were getting rid of school choice. Uh, uh, tr- and so we've got, so you have the ability to go to any one, any school district because the money follows the kid. It doesn't have to go to the school district just because it's down the street. And if you have the ability to take your kid to any school or get that kid to that school, hey, they can go to that school where, uh, whether they live there or not. It's, you know, yeah, I would, I would highly – hold on, white man. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, Milton Friedman's uh, Free to Choose, which is about school choice and the voucher system. And choice would add a lot of – just like in the first instance when we talked about monopolies, when you've monopolized K-12 through education, you don't see a lot of opportunities. You see a lot of segregation. You see here yeah. in Indianapolis, yeah. Manual High School graduating 36%. And Indianapolis, a, a podcast that I am the producer of called Leaders and Legends, we've, we've focused on Indianapolis and their reform in education because of Republicans and Democrats, backed by big money, by Fred Klipsch, Crystal DeHaan, major, if you've seen Klipsch speakers, that's that he has been a major funder of education here. There's the Lumina Foundation, which Sally May converted itself into a foundation. It's, it's headquartered here in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis is ground zero for educational reform. It's the testing ground. And in Leaders and Legends, we talked to the Mind Trust. We talked to David Harris. We talked to um, the heads of several colleges. The, the name of the Marion president is escaping me right now. We have an extensive, extensive conversations about education reform and the expansion of choice here in Indianapolis and how much that has benefited communities that are disadvantaged you know be it poor white kids poor black kids poor hispanic kids poor asian kids you know poor anybody who was would have been forced to go to a crummy school that was failing 15 20 years ago in ips the ips school now my my family some of my family members chose to send their kids to the ips magnet schools over the private school that they were going to go to because they're better. And so Indianapolis has been a model for expanding school choice, which has led to people, basically the leadership, the money, the, the politicians, everybody laid down their arms and said, we're not going to focus on what's best for our party. We're going to focus on what's best for kids, specifically kids that don't have the access to Fred Klipsch's money normally. And they built a system and they have built schools that are really rapidly advancing students of an economically disadvantaged situation. So I would highly encourage people to go check out the Leaders and Legends podcast and listen to some of those educational reform episodes. And you're going to hear a model for your city or your town on how to do some of this stuff. So, uh, Adam, that's, that's sort of the expansion of choice will, will help. But it, it comes down to people intentionally choosing to accept the truth that there are inequalities in our society and there are certain things that I can do and cannot do that the four panelists here or the listener, you know, 
inequalities will always exist, but how disparate are those inequalities and how can we best solve those together as opposed to exploiting those to, to tear ourselves apart. And uh, that's sort of how you get to a society that's more free and fair. But surprise, we didn't talk about the government. We talked about humans choosing to cooperate with each other on a one-to-one -one basis voluntarily to make things better. And, and like you touched on there, that um, giving some more freedom of choice, un unlocking some options for people will let kind of market pressure take yeah. effect. And the, and the quality will rise. Right. Yeah. Okay, Mark's so incredible things. Yep, so Maybe what, we're... quiet white man. Uh, so, <laughs> so Adam, what is your fourth question? Um, just in practice of a libertarian society, you know, if we can advance to a point where um, we're not being forced to pay taxes for things like uh, trash collection or street maintenance, and that, you know, if we're if we're entering into those things voluntarily then what happens, what do we do with that neighbor who doesn't want to chip in and help out? What do we do? Well, murder uh, is first. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. H H Hody, Harry, which one of you want to take this first? Reinhold, you, you're going last a lot. Who wants to go? How to deal with the person that doesn't want to chip in. When one, there is societal pressure, uh, I know that has been looked down upon with cancel culture in the last few years, uh, but it is very powerful uh, as it has been shown. Uh, I think the, I think some people have weaponized and has done bad things with this powerful tool, just like they have done with government force, which is the idea of people coming together to do stuff. You could do it without the force of the government, you know, and just have the community or organization, but that person is one. You could find out, you know, it is his voluntary choice as this person. And so it's just more of, you know, someone's got to be able to take that, have that human connection. It's like, well, why aren't they doing it? Are they, are they actually reaping the benefits of it? Are they, what is the one thing that you guys are doing that he doesn't want help or he just doesn't want to help out? If that's the case and that's who this person is, it stinks, but you know, there will always be that, per that you know, there can always be that rich person. That just so wants so you're place. arguing, hey, there's just always going to be some loss in any type of v venture where you're sharing it with other people. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's just like doing a project. There's always going to be that one person that's, you know, doesn't do anything and you have to carry everyone across the finish Adam, line. Adam, were you the first chosen in the group project or were you the one who like, oh, I'll kind of help out or would you just like, hey, thanks for doing this, guys? <laughs> uh, I was more likely to be the person that's just along for the ride. You tell uh, me what I need to do and I'll chip in. I was the one that I was the person that literally everybody goes, Spangle, can I be in your group? <laughs> I was like, oh, friends, cool guys. <laughs> I'll do your work for you. Yeah. So the thing is, is that society kind of will take care of that. Those, those bad actors, as we talked about before, they're going to exist. Mm -hmm. They exist now. You know, government yeah. hasn't solved that problem. That, that's you know, the funny thing is that everybody goes, it's going to be so much worse when we yeah. have a libertarian society. All these horrible things will happen like murder and rape and theft. And you go, unlike now, like your magical <laughs> government society has solved all those problems. Yeah, the, the, the best one about that is the, the FDA where like, we're going to, you know, we're going to make sure your food is healthy or you don't have E. coli everywhere. And how, right. how far do we go every couple of weeks? There's an E. coli outbreak. Somewhere. You're one bad spinach leaf away from death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's not, I don't think it's any better than it would be. You know, I mean, it mm -hmm. just seems kind of silly. We've got a thing called the United um, Underwriters Laboratories, right? So you don't have a government program saying that all electrical equipment has to be a certain way because Underwriter Laboratories took that on and did it successfully for a hundred years to where it just happens. We don't have to have government forced to do that because the, the people enter into it. People want to buy the product that they know has been tested. They know it's safe. So they go and get the one with the tag. So all the people who make the product would go to them and get it tested. They would say, we could do the same for food. It just requires the people to go, okay, I want to think for myself and go and get the tag of the stuff that I, I know is going to be safe instead of just buying whatever. 
So how that turns around to, let's say, your neighborhood where you've got a guy. So if you've got a guy living near you that doesn't want to get his trash taken away and pay for this trash get taken away, I mean, yeah, at some point it's going to be annoying and you might have to go over there and have a word with him. You know, they have the community get together and say, you know, you need to do something here. You're becoming a problem. But otherwise, if he wants to live like that, as long as it's not really affecting you, let him wallow in that misery. Right. I mean, that mm-hmm. at some point you can't you can't make people be something that they, they don't want to be. So. Uh, so I would say to this is, you know, and Hody, you're my purity outreach correspondent. Uh, you, you talk to the purity people. Contracts come up a lot, don't they, Hody? Oh, yes. One of the few things that people will make excuses to use government for. Well, like, I, you know, an ANCAP society where you're going to live. Oh, yes, ANCAPistan, uh, yeah. Right. Well, you know, yeah, the pro- well, me and Ryan Holt will be over in constitutional Republican land or minarcho-capitalism well, or whatever. Harry, yeah, minar- but, minarcho-capitalist. Yeah, but over in ANCAPistan where you live, there's going to be strong homeowners associations, won't there? I, I wholly hate the idea of homeowner hell. <laughs> I really do. And so I, I guess maybe I'm less ANCAP than you thought. I don't want to disappoint. But that's I, more I, feudalism. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of borders on the more feudal hoppy and thing. And a lot of ANCAPs love it. And I'm not I'm not big on it. I I don't. I, I will say I'm more of an anarchist than a minarchist, probably more than you guys, but I still don't I don't see myself giving over power. If I hated the government doing it, why would I hate some conglomerate owners, mm-hmm. you know, uh, owning my my whole neighborhood? I don't want the government owning my land. Why do I want somebody else owning my land? I right. thought the whole point was for me to own my land. You know, yeah, and, and that's the and that's the thing is that it's at that point is really still government, right? I mean, it's just called right. something else. Yes, you're still giving power up to someone else to tell you how you're going to do things. Um, so that's what always confuses me about the anarcho, the right. yeah, the encapistan is that it's still government, even though you don't call it that. Well, yeah. Uh, now let's talk about this. I, I love this question from you, Adam, because I think this addresses something. Libertarians get call, called idealistic, right? Right. We believe in this utopia, this beautiful land. Well, let's talk about that guy who's decided to unelect for all his services. He doesn't want any defense. He doesn't want any education. He doesn't want any trash, any roads. Well, what happens to that guy? Well, let's not pretend that bad guys stop to ex- stop existing just because we. Let, let's say significantly decreased or got rid of the size of the government. Did all the bad people go away? You know, let's, uh, uh, somebody told me this once, let's not pretend that some of these old mobsters were going to be like school teachers instead of mobsters, right? They're bad people. Bad people are out there and bad people want to prey on those people, right? There is a protection. This is something that has played out before. in these. And things. the more laws you create, the more, you know, the Rupert makes this point all the time. When you lock somebody up for a minor offense, you put them in with a better class of criminal, you diminish their chance of getting a job, and so they turn to a permanent life of crime where they're, they're like, well, this is just my life now. You know? And so you actually create more bad actors because you have criminalized so many behaviors, Hody. Yep. That, that's, uh, believe it or not, that's all I had to say about it. <laughs> right. Uh, I, so, Adam, can you deal with the fact that in a libertarian society – you may or may not be able to trust your neighbor. <laughs> uh, so to follow up with, on that, is there a point where that guy who doesn't want to pay for sewer services, doesn't want to pay to have his trash hauled away, at what point, is there a point where that becomes so damaging to his neighbors that he is violating the non-aggression principle, or am I wrong on that? No, I think I think you can make the case that something like pollution, for instance, does violate the non-aggression principle, and you would have the right to turn them into. So, so what an and cat believes, and I have always struggled with this. Walter Block came on the show and tried to explain it to me, and I just was like, you know, what if my what if I don't recognize your police force? Like, you know, it's it's basically if I grew up in Plainfield and Avon had their own town court and police and. Avon contracted with this police force in this uh, court system and I killed somebody in Avon and then they came to Plainfield to arrest me and I'm like, bitch, I don't agree with your authority. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't quite know how all that would work out. I mean, that's why I'm not as um, skittish about the centralization of force in terms of the courts, 
do believe in private police forces, private fire, private, you know, uh, all, all that. But um, because once you centralize the force within the courts, then you have one court system in a jurisdiction that everybody recognizes that one authority instead of contracting with their own individual court system, right? Mm-hmm. Like if we're neighbors and you're subscribing to, you know, e-court and I'm subscribing to geo-court, I, 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 you know, it just, it gets, so, it gets to a point where I'm like, and I don't even know, Hody, if I'm representing it right, but this is how I understand it after 12 years of following libertarians. It gets convoluted. It's, it gets tough. But in a situation, I tend to believe that as much as I would like to live in a private society where I would live in a town uh, that has private services and government would cease to exist, I don't know that we're going to get there in my lifetime. Um, But all I can do is shows like this to try and answer your questions and get you to wake up and try and get more people so we can in future generations implement that. Um, but what I, what I would say is that generally people kind of mind their own business, don't they? You know, your neighbors kind of mind their own business. They have their property and the incentive is to take care of their property and they don't necessarily care about your property. They want you to take care of your property because it helps their property values. But in reality, most people are trying to protect their asset. Mm -hmm. And so the more ownership which you'd have much more ownership in a private society, including actually owning your land. Because if you buy a piece of property, you don't inherently own the land. Michael Badnarik's book, I think it's, it's called It's Good to Be a King, uh, kind of explains the idea that you don't really own your own land. Don't pay your property taxes and see if you own your own land in America. Um, but the reality is that the more that people own, the more they're going to take care of. Our, our wildfire episode wildly popular episode about wildfires, let me tell you. Um, But the solution is private ownership of forests because private forest ownership will incentivize that person to take care of that asset. And it will probably be owned by somebody like Frank Muir who cares about the environment more than you and I do and way more than a politician does. And and the five Would you rather rather see the Sierra Club Right. Manage our manage our parks as opposed to our government, who is just going to do things based off of whatever you know politics dictates at that time. Right. And so the the reality is that in a in a society based on private ownership, you're going to see more care of property and less incentive to pollute, because it it could diminish your ability to resell that piece of property, which would be a much more important currency than even now in our private society adam so does that make sense yeah yeah the more people the more responsibility own their their own things have a vested interest in their own things there there's that neglect is going to become more rare mismanagement should become more rare Mm -hmm. personal responsibility is the key word yes you will become responsible for more. Um, and as, as, as we have become responsible for more in the internet age, what have we done? We've created virtual assistants. We've created AI. We've, we're a very, very uh, economical species where we try to optimize everything all the time. And so people will go, it'll overwhelm me, all the subscriptions that I'd have to have. Okay, well, you'd have to manage your Disney Plus and your trash subscription. Right. Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's, and there's going to be people who are offering services to help manage your property and you'll pay them $50 a month to do it. And you'll also pay your Hulu and your Disney plus and your other subscription. Like we overcomplicate it to scare people out of the idea of, of having these private services, because you think if the government goes away, these services are going to stop. And that's not the case. You're going to have better service. Mm-hmm. Because the person actually on the garbage truck, uh, well, that's they have one company running the garbage for a city, right? What if you had two? What if you had three? Well, what if you had four fire departments? I can speak to that. Currently, where I live at, we don't have government trash pickup, right? Yeah, so Adam, we- Adam Reinhold lives in Goat Kapistan out in uh, yeah. Bum <laughs> fucking, yeah. I live in my own little country. So but we don't have the, that government pickup stuff. So we have to go and, and 
make a deal and, and pay for our trash removal. So I have a company that I work with and then there's three other companies that I've seen drive by uh, my neighbor who uses a different company than I do. And I know that if uh, for some reason I'm not getting the service I need from the company I'm working with, I can go to the other company and have them come and, and take my trash instead. So that way I get competition in it. I'm paying for it. I just have it pay, you know, automatically out of my, my bank account. I like a subscription. It's just like when the cable company, you know, everybody's going from cable and cutting the cord. Now they have all these different subscriptions. People are going to do that because they care about it and, and it's important to them. So they're going to, you know, manage their Netflix and their Hulu and their Disney plus. Right. So that's going to happen. So in that situation, like, like I live in, you know, I don't know too many neighbors who just kind of let their garbage pile up and pile up to the point where it bugs us. We don't have, you know, the government telling us about that. We just do it because that's the way it is. All right, Adam, any other questions about that kind of topic? Like, did we answer that? Or were we talking uh, over your head? No, I, I think that's a good answer to that. Um, on a little bit, uh, changing topics a little bit, um, what does a libertarian in, in like a local government role look like? Like a uh, school board or city council or like, how do you apply libertarian principles in those roles? And how, you know, what are the policy agendas for somebody in those roles? So are we, are we looking at it from like modern day to day, you get elected to county council, or are we kind of thinking about what would it look like in libertarian Kapistan? For somebody today. All right. How, how in, in today's political environment, in today's regulatory environment, how would a libertarian uh, take on those roles? And, and what would they seek to accomplish in those roles? Because I am the proud owner of the Wall Podcast Network, I will uh, refer you to the Boss Hog of Liberty. Uh, that is a podcast that we started several years ago out in Henry County, Indiana, Newcastle, Indiana. And those guys have their own studio in downtown Newcastle, Indiana. And it's a, it's a small town. And what they, they have become the media there because who the hell would have a newspaper in uh, Newcastle, Indiana? They have a newspaper, but it's, you know, not very well run, very poorly rated. Uh, and, <laughs> Please steal our articles. And so um, they, they have become the media, the, the dominant media in Henry County, Indiana, because they, they talk about a lot of these issues. And so I would refer people overall, if you want to get a deep dive that's fun and uh, some might call listenable, uh, education on this specific question, then check out the Boss Hog of Liberty on the We Are Libertarian Network. But, um, you know, I, I, I think this is where a lot of libertarians fight, and this is the breakdown. This is the, this is the breaking point for a lot of people because philosophy is really easy, and having and ha having answered the questions that we've answered over the last you know hour and thirty minutes, those are really easy because that's all theoretical. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard when you start applying any set of principles to the human uh, animal. <laughs> you know, if, it, it, it's very difficult when you start applying Christian principles or, or Muslim principles or liberal principles or socialist principles or libertarian principles to, to enacting them. Because back to the diversity conversation, there's a lot of people in the world and there is a lot of different viewpoints and there are a lot of different backgrounds. And so it can be very hard. And so what I always say to libertarians is be as libertarian as you possibly can and be proud of it. Openly announce that you're a libertarian and don't equivocate. Don't try to be well liked. And I think where a lot of libertarians on the pragmatic side break down is they try to get everyone to like them. And they get mad at libertarians when they do things that might make them not liked. And I've taken a lot of shit from libertarians over the years that locally since starting We Are Libertarians and turning it into a real podcast for, for, for doing things that just make us look bad and it looks like infighting. Like, sorry, I'm converting thousands of libertarians a year and, you know, that, that's just the cost of doing business. Um, we're not all one Borg. We're not all an amalgamation of each other. Um, and 
the reality is that if you're going to be in politics, you're going to have to do things that make, make you disliked. Republicans are going to dislike you. Democrats are going to dislike you. Your own party will dislike you even more. The most bitter fights are intra-party fights. Not, I expect a Republican to shiv me in the back, but if I'm a Democrat, I can't believe the other Democrat did that in that primary. That's the most bitter fights. Um, and so, you know, it, whatever you are, be one proudly. And uh, that, that's where you'll get ahead the most. And so if you are a pure libertarian and purity and being the, a real libertarian and having the Mises caucus like you the most is your goal, then you're probably not going to want to run for office. Because if you run for office as a pure libertarian, most of the public is going to think that you're a batshit fucking crazy person. Uh, right, Harry? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's also a line to it, too, you know, because you got to be stand up, be proud, but stop at the point where you're on stage and get ready to take your clothes off and dance. <laughs> Just stop there. And, you... and, and the inverse, if you're trying to run a campaign that is tailored to getting the political insiders to like you, you're going to look milk toast. The libertarians aren't going to support and like you, and the public probably won't care either. And so, the reality is people like confidence and they like to know exactly where you stand. And that's why Donald Trump is president and Hillary Clinton is not. Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton tries to project what you ought to think she is. And Donald Trump is just an unapologetic person. Like people don't like apologies. And so um, whenever you run for office, you're going to have to run for the office that you're seeking because it's a job interview. And so if you're running as a county commissioner, you can run as libertarian as possible, but once you get elected, you may be faced with choices, as our friend Jeremiah Morrill faced when he was on the parks board, uh, the decisions that are not clear-cut NAP violations. Do we move the doughboy from this part of the park to the other part of the park? The most divisive thing I've ever seen in local <laughs> politics was this stupid fucking doughboy <laughs> where, where boomers were protesting moving this World War I statue from one end of the park to the other, this guy had personally donated tens of thousands of dollars to build this veterans memorial featuring this Doughboy statue that was mass produced in 1920 or something. And it, it was in this dilapidated part of the park. Nobody ever knew it was even there. And he was moving it to a prominent position. And you would have thought that literally Jeremiah had nuked Rusheville. Like it was insane. I mean, and so there's no, like, inherent libertarian position on should the doughboy be in its old spot or its new <laughs> spot, you know? And so that's part of being in office is dealing with the peculiarities and the weirdness of people, and it's getting along with people. Politics is the people business. It's about networking. It's about being nice to people. It's about being friends with people. It's about making deals. It's about I'll trade my vote for this vote. It's about trading information. And... Uh, Oftentimes in politics, you know, philosophy has very little to do with it. It's, it's more like sales and marketing than it is, you know, writing code. You know, it's, it's to put it in business terms, you know, there, there's, there's not a philosophy just doesn't enter into it. There are some clear cut things. I think if you look at somebody like Rand Paul or Thomas Massey, we said this on the last episode. You know, Thomas Massey or Rand Paul, because they're Republicans, on the things that don't really matter in terms of libertarian philosophy, just sort of go, yeah, I'll, I'll say Trump shouldn't be impeached because who really cares? Like, I'm going to save my powder for something that matters. And then when he tries to start a World War III with Iran, then Rand Paul gets all up in Trump's face. And the Republicans go, ah, this effing Rand Paul, I can't believe what a jerk he is. But then like three weeks later, he's like, we need to out the whistleblower. And they're like, yay, Rand Paul. You know? And so I think somebody like Rand Paul has made the, the calculated choice of like, I'm going to be a homer on the things that don't really matter to liberty. But on the things that do matter to liberty, I'm going to be principled and I'm going to really like, you know, I, I've criticized him for so long from probably episode one in 2012 for <coughs> endorsing people like Mitt Romney or the, who who was the pedophile down in Alabama? Alleged pedophile. Roy Neese. Moore. Oh, Roy Moore. <laughs> Not James Neese. Um, 
you know, so so when it when it comes to politics, the other parties have this too. If you're a pure conservative, whatever that should mean in 2020 anymore, who knows? Or if you're a progressive Democrat. Uh, and you're Bernie Sanders, although it's working for him tonight as he's winning the New Hampshire primaries. Uh, Andrew Yang dropped out, by the way. Uh, so my, my, my Yang is out. Uh, so the, the purity really doesn't apply here. So uh, anybody else kind of want to jump in on this, like where policy and, and philosophy meets politics? Well, I mean, I always take it as meaning that um, – so, so people want to vote for somebody – who shares their ideas, but they also want to make sure that they can get up the next morning and still have their jobs, still have their property, still have everything they need uh, that they want and they care about protected. So the idea of coming in as a libertarian and saying, we're going to swipe, we're going to get rid of all government today. We're going to get rid of everything here. We're going to do all the stuff that would be libertarian. Um, that's going to scare people because that's just going to feed uncertainty. So what, I've always said is that you have to prove those libertarian principles little by little to people to get them to embrace them in order to build on that. Right. So I think in the, in a local community, it, it makes it a lot easier to say, okay, we've got a libertarian on the school board and he's making sure that school runs more efficiently. Um, he's open for school choice. My kids are learning better. The kids, the grades, the, the class grades for everybody in the area is, are going up you know, show success, but still doing uh, libertarian values where, you, where you're able to. And then you can start convincing people that this might be a better way to go and there's some other ideas we can push forward too and get them to come along and give you a chance. But if you just try to come in, like uh, Adam Kokesh said on TV not too long ago, where he said, if I get elected president the next day, I'm just gonna disband the government completely. Nobody's, you know, going to go with that because it's just it's just going to scare them it's going to create crazy talk so you have to build the trust of the voter uh, you have to convince them and make sure that they understand that you hear what they're saying you hear what their concerns are and you're going to make sure you take care of or, or at least consider those things yeah if you think that the government the collapsitarians are the funniest people on the planet like you think the government collapses tomorrow we have the end times they're here and you, you're going to open up the new constitutional convention and you're going to somehow walk out with a libertarian, uh, a better libertarian republic? Like what? <laughs> the, the people are choosing the government they have now. You think that they're going to choose a more libertarian government than the one they have? Bernie Sanders is going to be the nominee for the Democrats. Christ you know, and has a shot at winning the president. Uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. Biden, Biden is in fifth or sixth place tonight. He's done. He's in, he's in fifth. He's not done yet. He's done. This is just he's New done. Hampshire. It, listen, he, listen, you lying dog face pony rider. Yeah. I'm just, all I'm saying is that we're going to know more between now and at no, the end of dreaming. Nevada and you're South Carolina. He's done. He, he can't, he's, I'm not saying he's done. He's done. He's done. Oh, man. So right. you brought up five Hody. examples of things that you wanted. Yes, this is Hody. Uh, city council, school board, judge, sheriff, mayor. All five of those have incredible opportunities to help the community. Now, to do so in a libertarian way, you say, well, they're granted some authority, which libertarians don't seem to want. Now, here's the thing. What we do want is people still want outsourcing. This is still what freaks them out. They say, well, you know, I don't want to just have to build all my pencils on my, by my own tomorrow. And I'm used to this company doing it under these directions from government doing it. So when you get an opportunity, let's just take school board, for example, to say, well, I don't want to all of a sudden be responsible for my kids' education all by myself and have to homeschool them and have to teach them. And have, I still want somebody else to teach my kids. I'm not good at it being a teacher. I liked it being outsourced. I like, I like the experts doing it. And that's good. You should like experts doing it. You know, you, I, don't, I, I love the homeschooling movement. Absolutely nothing to get against it. I do it with my kids right now. But if I did not feel comfortable there, I would absolutely outsource it. When we go out to a restaurant, we outsource eating. They cook better than us. So I went out there, you know. You go to a supermarket. Oh, you didn't grow those bananas yourself. You outsourced it. So when you're on a school board, you say, we're going to outsource, you know, some of this stuff. Well, instead of doing the government route, just do some private route. Say, hey, we're used to funding things this way. We're used to using textbooks are a big one. 
if you want to look at corruption within like school boards, you know, you're going to get a lot of pushback to use these specific government textbooks and say, you know what, I think we give these guys an opportunity. They've actually been proven to be a little less biased. The teachers work better with them. The kids have better results and you show those things. You can record the minutes. One of the things you can do in a city council school board is be incredibly transparent. You'll find that most of your city councils won't be, they'll be on social media, but they won't broadcast to social media. Be that guy that creates that transparency. We that, want, that's a great point. Let me interject yeah. there as yeah. I usually do. Cause it's my show. Uh, yeah. The, the folks out in Rushville, when I was executive director, where I first met Jeremiah Morrill, his parents were chairs of the Rush County Party. They took a video camera to the county council meetings, set it up and put the meetings on YouTube. They killed a $100 million project because it freaked those old guys out so much. This is going on YouTube. I'm going to be on you. What? The, these 75 year old men who didn't know what YouTube's was all of a sudden had a camera in their face and they couldn't believe that this was going to be seen by literally three people, but they didn't know any different because they're boomers, right? Like taking a camera to a county council meeting is not done. Nobody does that. And so they held them accountable by being quote unquote, the media, which is sort of where the boss hog idea came from. Go ahead, Hody. I'm, I apologize for derailing for some. I'm glad you had a real example of it. So, you know, there, there's an example of school board, city board. Let's talk about uh, mayor and sheriff. Sheriff, extremely important position. Because here's the thing. You might not know this. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Marijuana is not legal anywhere. Don't let people lie to you otherwise. Marijuana is federally illegal everywhere. But some states say, no, we're not going to enforce that. We're state. going to do this instead. We are going to sell it and tax it and make a crap ton of money for our state because you feds say it's illegal. So that's what we're going to do. Now, of course, we're against the tax thing. I'm not saying that. But you have an opportunity on a county level to say, hey, I mean, the sheriff says, hey, guys, we're going to be arresting, busting down these doors. They got pot. The feds say to do it. As sheriff, you have the opportunity to say, no, we're not going to do that. And there are some sheriffs maybe not libertarians, but who, have, well, there are libertarian sheriffs, but there are some libertarian or not who have said, I am not going to break into people's houses and shoot their dogs over your stupid drug, drug laws. And you know what? They become incredibly popular and they become incredibly suppressed in the news because we don't want that. Look at mayor, another great opportunity to say, hey, normally we fund these things by taxing everybody, by getting these, you know, and, and there are some and now there actually are libertarian mayors that say, you know what, we're not doing the tax thing anymore. We're going to collect voluntary donations. Hey, cities, you guys, you know, you like your roads and the condition they're in. We're going to take those collections. Now, you know how well government does with roads, probably, uh, if you've ever uh, – nicked your car on a uh, pothole or, or if you've been in indiana you know pothole joe you know very well how the government does with roads and yet you look at when these may when these mayors turn to a voluntary collection service for these roads and hire out private contractors that are responsible for their work they drastically improve transparency accountability and you have a, a great opportunity to outsource to a voluntary instead of an involuntary subject the other thing you can do reveal corruption this is something that a lot of these positions get. If you are a sheriff, you're going to get a mandate that is not ethical. If you're a mayor, you're going to get a pushback from a state representative that is not ethical. And you have the opportunity, most of the time, they combat it behind closed doors, they come to some kind of agreement, and we need more libertarians out there to say, the school board asked me to publish their textbook, which is wrong, and it has incorrect information, and they say if I don't, they're going to pull this funding. We need more people out there saying stuff like that. I was muted because I've been blowing my nose. Anybody else? All right, Adam, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Hody had some great stuff there. I appreciate that. And uh, Hody, by the way, w word of warning, I was a homeschool kid myself. So, you know, I picked up on you. that. <laughs> <laughs> he's, in he's too inquisitive to not be a homeschool kid, right? He would, he would anger any us, teacher. Unlike us dumb public school idiots. Okay, jerk. <laughs> uh, I, I, you, listen, you deserve it. I mean, we roast homeschoolers all the time, so you should feel superior. Uh, all right. Final question, Adam. You got it. Uh, what got one more? Yeah. So when it comes to 
foreign policy, you know, beyond non-aggression policy and, you know, hopefully non-interventionalism, what does libertarian foreign policy look like? Anybody want to take this first? Um, well, I'll just say that what I think that libertarian foreign policy looks like is that we don't use our military except for defense. Um, we can help coordinate the private uh, charities and things like that to help other countries get, um, you know, out of, you know, problems that they have, natural, you know, natural disasters, that sort of things. We go and help as best we can in that but we do it through a coordination of private industry to do it or private charities to do it instead of doing it as a government thing. Um, but otherwise we have a defense uh, that's impenetrable and, and really the defense that's impenetrable in the United States is the fact that we own guns, right? There's a reason why Japan did not try to take land uh, attacks against the United States during world war II because they knew that we all had guns. And it would be such a slog to try to take over the country because of that. So I think as long as we're all, def we're all protected with our weapons, we've got a strong defense. We don't need to be telling other countries how to, you know, run their businesses. Uh, but we can definitely help and give advice uh, all day long. Uh, I would say that first, no standing military. I think the founders had that absolutely correct. Uh, having a standing I'm military. Not disagreeing with, you know, I mean. No, no I, I'm not saying that you said that. I'm saying that's what I would. My <laughs> um, I do agree with self defense. I mean, self defense, it's not just about protecting your person, but also your community. Uh, just as the farmers in the revolution were able to fight off the British in, in 1776 and 1812, and uh, obviously the Civil War, sadly, uh, were able to fight each other, the wall of Northern aggression. Uh, it, it's about protecting the community as well. That's also what the Second Amendment is about. Um, and so, you know, right now we don't have that same concept. We think, oh, I'll call 911, and then 45 minutes later you get somebody to take a report, and then they don't do shit. Um, but I, I would say no standing military, uh, a well-armed defense at home. I think those are two. But I think economics are, are, are king. It's the economy, stupid. I think if you look at what, what China is doing with its Belt and Road program, that really Vice was the first kind of media outlet here in the United States to, to their HBO show, if it's still on, is was great with embedded journalism where they go and show you what's happening. And what China is doing is they're going to poor countries in Asia, Africa, New Zealand's the first kind of... Uh, English speaking country to sign on to Belt and Road. And they're building soccer stadiums and roads and bridges and infrastructure in places like Africa in exchange for oil and resource rights. The United States uses its military might to secure all of these things. Uh, the United States uses force and uses the, the threat of force to, to make all these things happen. Whereas China is building for the China century through Belt and Road, economic investment in these countries. And uh, there, there has been um, some neocolonialism with monopolies granted by the United States government to basically go in and take over uh, the rights. And that's going to happen with China. China is kind of doing the same thing where they're, they're saying, screw, screw the West, we're going with China. And then they end up in the same situation where their resources are given to the Chinese for very little in return. Um, but if you, look at, if you look at like why the United States and China don't attack each other, why is the reason? Not, not only because of nuclear weapons, but largely because they don't want the destruction of both economies, the world economy. The, the economy has become so intertwined in a global economy because of the internet, because of transportation and shipping, that is the real reason that people don't go to war in the same way they did 100 years ago. And so the more uh, we can grow free markets across borders and lessen trade barriers, get rid of tariffs, dumb, dumb Trump, uh, <laughs> then it, it will increase. Uh, it will increase security because we have a vested interest in not fighting Germany anymore, don't we? Uh, and so 
there's just this idea that it, it, it's that if we don't have a strong military, then the entire world and the title, everything's going to collapse. That's just not the case. Money rules the world, not force. Uh, this is not the 1700s. Uh, and the reality is that we have gotten so efficient and optimized, again, as a species, the ability to kill each other on such a grand scale that World War One and World War II are, are hopefully the last that we'll ever see of, of global conflicts between major powers because – um, our abilities now are nothing like they were then. So um, I think economic interdependence is is a huge part of it. Uh, and if we can if we can start shaving off the money that we spend on the, the military, bring those troops home, and start investing back at home by saving that money, then I think we'll be better off. Yeah. Uh, one thing is governments have wars. Uh, human beings with each other they have disagreements and they just go to court to settle those agreements uh, disagreements um when we had the episode it's like everyone was it was like wondering if uh, the whole world's gonna go to war because of the Iran thing the reason why like the if you really like research a lot of the hans ferdinand thing is a lot of those times uh, a lot of the world war one and war two those are coming out of the large bits of you know, monarchs, the last gas of the monarchs going out, you know, getting power by going to war with your neighbor and, you know, claiming resources with capital, with this system of capitalism, you don't really need that. You'll allow people to trade across borders. The internet has allowed us to talk to people. It has allowed the Hong Kong protesters to show us photos and talk to the people here in the United States. It's a lot, and it allows us to share the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution to tons of people who have never or would have access to it. So, I think the best foreign policy for the government to do is you know, one thing with the Rhinos do is just defense of the, you know, the landmass known as the United States, and then you just allow people to do what people really want to do: trade, you know, li live the best life, help each other out, help and make some, and make some cash. <laughs> it's you know it's i don't have to worry harry, about poor what, harry made a joke and we just left him hanging i know right <laughs> we just we yeah, just, said, just you know what? i saw so your weird. joke and you know what no that was oh, rude. this yeah. is how spangle feels how do you apologize oh. to him uh, i'm sorry <laughs> harry bro i should have been there thanks thanks Hody. thanks i appreciate that i'll catch uh, you next time I, dude yeah I, was, I laughed on the inside where it counts Okay. <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> right, old you, you old son of a bitch. <laughs> Comedy <laughs> legend, right here. <laughs> oh, God, right, old so funny, Harry. Go on. Anyways, uh, I don't have to worry about having a fight with somebody living in um, Iran or Russia because you know we can get online and settle our disagreements, or because we don't have one. We don't. We you know yeah, we can know each other. Your world is a hundred, the hundred people that are coming to your funeral. Those are the people in your life. Correct. Can, um, here, let me sum up this whole episode. The hundred people that are coming to your funeral, mm -hmm. just like if you ever watched Big Fish at the end, this is when it really <laughs> yeah. hit me. It's like, that's your universe. That's your mm -hmm. world. Worrying about what Russia or people in Idaho are doing is mm -hmm. nonsense. And mm -hmm. when people try to get you to care about Idaho or Russia, they're lying to you because the, <laughs> the only people that matter are the 30 people you interact with on a daily basis. That's who you impact, and that's what your world is going to look like in a private society. It's going to be you dealing with those 100 people. It's not going to be you dealing with the problems of the entire world. Like, government manipulates you to care about all this stuff, and you don't need to. All right, fuck you guys. Money? <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I think that 100 people is a little high for, for me, at least, because I know that. I know. Whoa, 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 right, hold. Just announcing, just announcing on Facebook, I have so many people who have blocked me that nobody would know about it anyway. Right. There'll, be, there'll be several people there. Okay, right, hold, at your funeral. Okay. I, I count, I think there would be five. I had to unblock him to get invited to this chat today. So this is, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, I wouldn't see the invite. I, it was, <laughs> I don't even refer to him by his real name. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Chris is talking about economy. We're kind of getting on that. That's really important. I could get into the weeds because I'm an economy nerd, but let me make it real general just to, to kind of get it summarize it. Economy is the distribution of resources. What resources are there when you're involved in a war or a conflict or stationing soldiers? There's no resources gained. In fact, that's an expenditure, right? So all these are things that you should 
have to do. You know, if you have to send soldiers, then they should be over there. Right now, we're in a place where we want to send soldiers because money is not economy. People notice this that when the economy is health, healthy, sometimes people still aren't doing better. We talked about this a little on last week's episode, or they talked about it, but this is, this is kind of a problem with the economics of it. We give people an expensive job to do and say, well, look, our economy grew by five. If we spend $500 million, this is a real story, by the way, on a porcelain statue of a horse that we station outside of a mall, then our economy grew by $500 million. Except our resources, what we care about, shrink. You know, this should actually count against, this spending should count against what we actually have in resources. Because that's $500 million that could have been used putting people in college feeding the, the hungry, housing the homeless, you know, re, the actual resources that actually help people, you know, education, all these things that we talk about. So let me offer a very, this might seem unlibertarian, but I want you to think about this for a second. It would cost $30 billion for us to feed every hungry person on planet earth, $30 billion. We spend $680 billion on our United States military alone. If we spent 300 or $650 billion, decrease the size by about 5% and spent $30 billion handing out food and feeding every single homo per- homeless person, ending all food on planet earth or a- ending all food, ending all hunger on planet earth. Do you think that we would be safer or in more danger? I guarantee we would be safer. Nobody's going to slap the guy in the face that's giving everybody out free food. So maybe that's how we start people on this Liberty thing. I'm not saying spend more. Obviously we still need to, to spend less, but if we spend better. And we say, well, try this instead. And maybe this goes back to your last question a little bit about what's a libertarian doing in politics. To say, like, let's try this instead. Oh, do you see how when we generate economy and open these lanes that we stop fighting with people? I mean, we're not, you know, we, we talk about conflicts with Britain. We're not fighting with them anymore because of economy. We, we relate. For yourself. Yeah. <laughs> hey, British slogs. Idiots over there. Come over here and fight me with your knife, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> or the uh, the horn, right? The animal horn, the narwhal tusk, fending off. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're not actually actively Can't even keep at work. The Monty Python's alive. Come at me. <laughs> But, you know, this is this is the way economy is supposed to work, right? We open up these lanes and we say, oh, well, I you have stuff that we want. We have stuff that you want. And we would make that, we'll find a way to make that happen on some end. And it's always worked that way when it's allowed to voluntarily happen. When the government exists, it's usually very involuntary. Trump bragged about what? Putting 32,000 troops along the border of South Korea for in exchange for $500 million. And he made it sound like this is such an amazing deal. I put 500 troops on the border. I, I, but you put 32,000 troops on the border for $500 million. You can't even afford to keep them there for a week at that pay. I mean, this is the worst deal in the history of deals, but he's talking about because we actually got a little bit of a kickback in exchange for stationing them there. Right. And so we have to fix these economic. Reinhold, he's still, it's so cute. He still thinks that Trump has ideologies and yeah. plans. And <laughs> thought processes no. that actually function that aren't right. just two no, random he, neurons firing. This is a great deal because I'm in charge of it. Right. Because <laughs> it's my idea. So it's obviously it's, great. It's big. I mean, that's also, what it is. But there's also, Hody, just to, just to kind of add a little bit to that is that there's so many examples in history where when people in an area that's like usually war torn or they're fighting back and forth when they stop doing that and they just start relying on trade uh everything expanded so much better right so there's so many examples through history you can go back and look at and it's it's just the nature of things so it's usually something else that's causing the the friction and the wars and the and the fighting it's 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 you know it's occasionally access to resources but it's usually because somebody isn't wanting to make the deal to give the right resources up because i think people would rather just trade for it all right adam any any questions comments on that no no that was great i appreciate it all right well so how do you feel after after this uh two-hour clinic on have, we scared, have we scared you away from libertarianism and now you're going to run back? <laughs> well, I think I, I might have to uh, look up a couple of books and do a little bit of reading 
uh, dive a little deeper on a couple of things. But um, yeah, I appreciate this. It's been a great evening. All right. Excellent. Well, we were so glad that you could join us and we, we really do appreciate it. I'm well, going to think uh, I, 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 I was going to say I was going to forego wherever. I've been up since 4.30, and it's now 9.30 p.m., but I will give you the floor. Everybody give, give a couple minutes summation, uh, anything that you might have missed, and then we'll say goodbye to Adam, and I'll, I'll uh, make an appeal for, for more folks to come on. So go ahead, Reinhold. Okay, I just want to say don't let anybody harsh or buzz for trying to learn about libertarianism yeah. or say that you're not a real libertarian because you haven't think this or thought that because you haven't gone through and thought about that yet. I mean, they may be right that you're not pure libertarian yet, but nobody goes there one day. Take your time, learn what you want to learn. And if it is right for you, embrace it. If it's not, don't. Don't make anybody force you to that either. So just- Has anybody name called you yet? Like, have you been told you're not libertarian enough online? No, no, I, I don't know if I've been brave enough to really uh, put right. myself in a position to get name called. <laughs> Guys, he's not let, a real libertarian then. He's not been made fun of. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> let him do it. I, I just laugh at people now when they sit there, they'll call me uh, a liberal, a socialist, uh, all kinds of things. And I'm just like, no, I'm not a middle of the road libertarian for the most part. Um, I've, I've thought about this and, and, and written about libertarianism for 30 years and uh, I'll have a discussion with you. We can debate it, but don't try and tell me that I'm something that I know I'm not. I am, because so. you're an adult and everybody on this channel has lives and families and identity pieces that are not just libertarian. Like if you're listening to me and you get super pissed off reading other libertarian, like, all right, I should speak to myself because <laughs> Ryan Lindsay is on my list and owes me a public apology, which he will be giving to me on Saturday because he tried to recruit George Papadopoulos or whatever that writer from that website from last week was. Uh, what was his name? I forget what his name was. The kid that wrote that. I think it was Pappas or something like that. Yeah, Jeff Pappas. He was trying to recruit him to write for Wall Reader, and I'm going to make him apologize to me for, for angering me on a Saturday. But in general, most people, like, if you're just like, if you get so heated about politics and it really gets you amped up, and like when people criticize libertarians, like when I worked for the Libertarian Party, the reality is that the majority of my identity was wrapped up in being a libertarian. That was my identity. I didn't, I didn't have a healthy self image. I didn't have health. I didn't have a good marriage. I didn't have anything going on in my life except that job. And so when people would criticize the LP, I would get so upset. And now that I have, you know, healthy relationships, I, you know, I have healthy friendships, I have good friends, like it's, the reality is it doesn't bother me anymore. So if it bothers you, don't, don't get all, all bent out of shape. So don't let this become your identity, Adam. It's a very sad life when you get angry <laughs> over someone Oh, what are you guys just gonna get one percent in the next election? And it made it would make me so mad. But the reality is, we'd get one percent in the next election. <laughs> so. Final thoughts, Harry. Well, uh, time to pander to the right wing. Don't forget to stock up on your your supplies. Um, you know the coronavirus is out there. Uh, don't forget to check your rep. Make sure you have a. Uh, your mask already and uh, emergency supplies in your basement. And I'm not talking about food and MREs because those people have those. I'm talking about alcohol. If you're going to be stuck in your house, if you be possibly quarantined and stuck in your house for two weeks, it's going to suck without alcohol. Yeah. But no alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Harry doesn't need an audience. He made himself laugh. <laughs> yeah. See, I, mean, my own, I can make my own jokes. Don't need you guys. I make my own <laughs> yes. jokes and I, I laugh at my own self. It's I'm okay. going to one of my homes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's okay. I'm one more home away, and I'm beating in a and I uh, get that Bernie money. <laughs> Hody, final thoughts. I can absolutely confirm that being an alcohol-free household sucks. So there you go, Harry. <laughs> um, <laughs> even drink bright or God forbid a warm beverage with caffeine in it. Well, I got to get back to rolling around in my Mormon money. But before I do that, I did want to I did want to just say, you know, something that I've learned from Chris, actually, when he goes on different shows, he is hesitant to provide a specific solution. I think as a libertarian, I absolutely struggle with this. I, I would say I don't even struggle with it because I don't do it. I don't even try. I love to provide solutions. I find my favorite one and I plug it in. And I say, wouldn't it be cool if the world worked this way? 
if you take a libertarian society, you can't possibly fathom what it will look like because the market will pour in a million bajillion different solutions. There's not one solution like, oh, it's easy in a libertarian society, the roads would be built by businesses because I have these examples of when they used to be before government interfered. Well, we also haven't been built by farmers and families and individuals and communities and you know whatever, whatever it may be. We have no clue. Oops, sorry. So watch yourself. I think it's easy to get, home, get caught up in a libertarian like me that will try to say, here's the libertarian answer to that. And it's a very specific, concrete answer. And that's good to have those kind of answers and those kind of examples, but allow yourself the freedom and fr flexibility to say, you know, I don't know what that will look like right now. It, you know, suck it, suck it up and have a hu little humility. We're not experts about everything. We didn't talk about global warming or anything. I, 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 there are people who have dedicated their lives to studying weather that know more the, than me than I could possibly imagine about it. But I am hungry for their expertise. And I'm hungry for a market that says, man, take it away. You know, you guys that know this stuff, sell me something great, do something great. I don't know what that great thing's gonna look like, but I'm excited for it. You know, so I don't try to have all the answers and don't try to make yourself have all the answers. Be open-ended and say, you know what? I'm just excited for whatever the answer it is. You can look for it if you want, find some specifics. You will, we all have on most of these issues to say, this is what I think it will look like because I think this is the best answer. And indeed the market may choose a few of the best answers for a while. You know, always, always think it through and check yourself too. You may be the one guy who solves all of it. Yeah. You, know, you might go through all this and go, oh, this I want, we haven't thought about this. And, when, and here's a solution. And then it how just funny, all makes sense. How funny is that going to be when that's hairy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, but all joking aside, let me tell you, that's why I fell in love with wall, you know, because that they have a unique perspective as opposed to saying, here is the libertarian answer. You know, Chris has just said, man, I think I know what I would do if I was left on my own. Harry says, you know, I think I know what I would do too. You know, and now Reinhold's like, you know, I think I might do something a little different and I might do this. And I, I think that's just the beauty of it is having that kind of, they call panarchy, like a million different anarchies or whatever, but just having a whole bunch of different answers and pouring it on and just being able to say, you know, the market is going to choose the best answer. It always has and always will. I now have and, a name for my internal monologue, panarchy. Yeah. And before we go to Harry, I just want to say one thing, Hody. You need to stop saying they when you talk about wall. You're a wall too. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> you saying, well, they do this and they do that. No, you're part of it. Well, uh, yeah. Back in you the may day. You not want to – you just – you need to own it because, you know, you can't avoid it. I am 100%. Gonna, no escape think, now. <laughs> it, it's the opposite. I just – I think for me, I love listening so much. It's almost hard to participate because I'm like, oh, I don't want to override what awesome thing you guys had to say. But us guys have to say. That's yeah. right. That's Harry, right. Harry, That's Harry you already went, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. That's right. Thanks for yeah. listening. Randall. I gave my commercial on um, uh, stocking up on your alcohol supplies. That's true. <laughs> That's right. I know. It's funny how everybody's personality comes out in this part. Like Reinhold's like, read no more. Harry's like, you're all going to die. Stock up. And Hody's like, let's be friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks so much, Adam, for joining us. We really do appreciate your time and, and having the courage. Now, I really want other people to do this. I really want other people. I know Austin has sent me some questions. I know there's a couple people in the email box that have sent questions. So we're going to do this again, maybe here in the next uh, couple weeks or a month or whatever. We just didn't have anything juicy to talk about this week. And so uh, we were fortunate that Adam had sent in, in these questions and we could do this episode for everybody. So please do not hesitate to write editor at wearelibertarians.com. Let me know that you'd like to come on and do this just like Adam did. Come on, you do a Zoom. It takes you three hours. You tell us, uh, you know, give us like the two to four questions that you want to talk about. We did six tonight and maybe next time we'll do, you know, if we have the same crew, we're going to have to do four maybe because I'm, I'm long-winded and Boy, are they, uh, except for Harry. Harry Harry's not long-winded. He's short, sweet, and buy your bullets and stock up on food. Mm -hmm. um, but, Adam, tell the people uh, your experience. This wasn't that scary, was it? It was not. This was my first ever video conference, and it was painless. Excellent. That's what <laughs> we like to hear. First podcast, too? Absolutely. We were gentle? I feel loved. All right, good. We see. 
Dear Leader is generous and thorough. That's all I will say. So yes, <laughs> please don't hesitate. Uh, I know Miranda was a little nervous. She had a great time. And, and Adam, follow back up with us. I'd love to hear kind of, you know, six months from now, you know, did, hey, you shared this with your friends and family. Did they start asking you a bunch of questions? And then did, Miranda is like an expert now after coming on. She's turned into like the libertarian queen in her, in her circle and, and is just really nailing it. And we're really proud of her. That's and awesome. uh, going to have her back on hopefully at some point and asking some other questions. But, you know, I'd love to hear, hear six months from now, you know, kind of what happened and what was the fallout. And if there's anything interesting, hit us up. But uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Hody, Reinhold, Harry, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we will be back. Uh, we, may, we may not do a live show next week. I'm going to just do a, an on-air staff meeting. I'd like, to, I'd like to air another PATH episode that I did this weekend with Brian Nichols. He was really, really good. We talk a lot about you know, how, how to have a functioning political movement and his path to libertarianism from conservatives. Really good. If something interesting happens, we're going to do an episode next Tuesday. At this point, there's nothing out on the horizon that's like a pressing issue, so we may do a, a pre-recorded. So next week, uh, just be prepared for that. But Lots of content out there for you folks to listen to. There's lots of episodes of We Are Libertarians that we reference that you can go back and listen to. Listen to that Brian Nichols episode next week. Uh, please subscribe to the Other Wall podcasts. Get Now Hear This, my radio show that I'm doing here in Indianapolis. Even if you don't live in Indianapolis, I think you're going to find a lot of the discussions. What I try to do is, hey, describe the problem you're solving. If you have drug, drug addiction, what is that like? And uh, like the one that I recorded today, you know, T was just so powerful in describing what she went through in the, in the process of recovery. I think it, you know, uh, really, you'll find that podcast interesting. If you found this interesting, if that really speaks to you and you want to understand nonprofits and how they work, get now, hear this, uh, check out the pat down. That is a comedy podcast. It's the funniest podcast you will ever hear. There is no other podcast like this on the planet. This is just dry and boring as can be compared to the pat down. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, and, uh, you know, all the other shows, Brian Nichols Show, Boss Hog of Liberty, Ginger Archie, The Swamp. We've got all kinds of podcasts. Just go type in We Are Libertarians to your Apple, Google, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, whatever, wherever you listen, just, go, just search We Are Libertarians or my name, Chris Spangle, and all those shows will pop up. And uh, we really appreciate you supporting the network. We really appreciate you listening every single week. We really appreciate you writing in and letting us know how we're impacting you. We uh, love our patrons and we really appreciate you sharing this. This is a great episode to share with your friends. It's uh, non-combative and uh, we hope that this really helped you. So please share with your friends and we will see you next week. Thanks everybody for listening.